Monday, October 21st, and I'm going to call the board selecting the meeting to order. Um, start with our usual announcements. This meeting is being taped by 1623 Studios for future broadcasts. <coughs> Also being recorded by Gail Hunter for accuracy in minutes. Anybody else is recording the meeting is asked to notify the chair at this time. And um, if everybody could please take a moment to silence your cell phones or turn them off, as long as they're not ringing, um, we would all appreciate it. So. All right, um, our official item zero on the agenda is for um, Anybody has any comment for something that's not on the agenda tonight? Does anybody have any items under agenda, item zero? All right, so we have a relatively full agenda tonight. Um, and uh, I'm going to be teeing up each of these items as we go through them. Um, but I would like to get a little bit of a review of who is here for what item on the agenda right now. So item one is a review of recommendations for speed limits in the town. Who's here for that? All right. <clears throat> item two is a discussion about the special fall town meeting. All right. Uh, item three is an uh, interview for the police chief position. Who's here for that? All right. Uh, four is complete streets update. <clears throat> Five is Bike and Pedestrian Committee New Language for Official Charter. All right, <clears throat> I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go through the rest of it. Um, that that covers the basics. Oh, so let's start with item one, which is a review of recommendations and next steps for speed limits in the town. So this is, um, uh, we undertook a process to review the um, speed limits that we set in town under the new state laws that allowed for 25 mile an hour speed limits in town plus 20 mile an hour safety zones. Um, we established some of those uh, uh, previously uh, and the state came back with additional guidance to us saying that we had been a little bit overbroad possibly in um, some of our designations and we also um, uh, missed an aspect about a uh, regulatory aspect about uh, places where we'd asked for regulatory changes and speed limits in the past. So we have to make some corrections. So we put together a working group, um, which um, Todd Fitzgerald and, and Officer Luf have been working with, to um, make recommendations for changes. And they're going to present the basic set of recommendations today. We're going to um, ask any questions that we have about that set and decide on how we want the process to go from here. So with that, um, uh, Chief Fitzgerald, would you please uh, introduce the, the uh, recommendations you're making? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, back, I would say, sometime in the August time frame, uh, the board, as you know, asked us to uh, convene a working group with uh, several stakeholders in town to discuss the uh, current speed limits and how they coincide with the newly enacted uh, local option laws that the town uh, enacted a couple of town meetings ago. So as a result of this, the group met on September 4th of this year and all the major streets and roads were discussed. Uh, the PD uh, provided one year's worth of crash data to the group. We also pro uh, provided a breakdown of current speed limit regula regulations and uh, what we have on file with Mass DOT at this time. Uh, as a result the, uh, of this discussion, Sergeant Luf, who is here with me tonight, was able to uh, file a draft report that was sent out to the rest of the group that uh, met on September 4th. And after some uh, discussions back and forth with them, uh, I sent the report to uh, you guys uh, with the necessary recommendations and then keeping in mind the public, aid, public safety aspect of everything that uh, transpired with the uh, discussions at the working group. So uh, as we move forward uh, tonight, I think uh, my recommendation would be to get some public input on the draft, or on the report that we uh, filed with uh, the, you know, the board, and then uh, go, go from there to make the recommendations to uh, move forward with the changes that we uh, had uh, stated in the report. Okay. Questions from the board? Um, Todd, who comprised the working group? Uh, I no, no. Who, oh, who was well, on it, it was uh, uh, police, bike and ped, uh, fire, uh, town planner, uh, 
some other uh, uh, the uh, DPW fire department. Yeah. Okay. Downtown Improvement Committee. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> So, um, so reading the report, there were um, some regulatory speed limits that we had in place before, like 15 mile an hour speed limits um, down on Beach Street. And you're recommending um, that we stick with all of those old re regulatory. Stick with those recommended uh, those old regulatory speed limits because I think it's now been posted at 20 when it, when, it, when the state has it at 15. The other recommendation I would make to that is take the entire downtown, and that's something we needed to uh, discuss, I think, or part of the process of the public input is to get the uh, speed limit from like the Pine Street area all the way down to the Singing Beach Circle and then up to the 1661 Cemetery. In my opinion, that needs to be 15 miles an hour. Which I think would require a traffic, traffic or an engineering study. Okay. Can I ask the question, um, the engineering study, that it, is that done, or that information then goes into the state, correct? Yes. And then the state does have the ability to say yes or no. it's too slow? Too slow, correct. And then can they mandate, if they say it's too slow, can the state mandate what they think it should, or tell us what it would be? Uh, that would be... I don't think they can go back on what is already there and what has been approved by the state. Okay. Uh, but that would be a question for my counterpart, Chuck. Yeah. So I think what would happen was they would look at the data that we provided in part of the study uh, yeah. that we would do, and then they would uh, either agree or disagree, and then they might say the data that you provided shows X, and then they can they can decide unilaterally to make it that way, it the recommended, or agree with you in spite of the data that's presented. And the outcome of that becomes a regulatory decision? Right, correct. Right. The same way it got to be 15 today. Right, for part of it. Um, <coughs> so, um, seems unlikely that they would say now it should be 25, but is that a possible outcome? Because otherwise we would probably want to declare a safety zone in there and keep it at 20, right? Correct, yeah. Is that a risk? Is there? I think it could it could be a risk, but I don't see that. Personally, I don't see that happening. So, if you were going to submit a new engineering study, I would not include the current section, which already designated 15. Mm -hmm. Leave that alone, um, and only ask for either end. <coughs> I would I wouldn't touch what you already have. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so my my. Uh, question was really if we um, right now we could declare a safety zone in there reasonably so probably um, and put it at 20 miles now that would probably uh, pass state scrutiny without um, it being a regulatory. Well, I don't believe the downtown business that the district would uh, uh, fall under the realm of a safety zone. It would have to have a park, a school. <coughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. Questions from the board right now? This this area as as it's designated in the section of the recommended engineering study is in the full body of the report all designated as safety zone. Other than the fifteen moving back to the fifteen mile an hour speed limits um, from Union Street to down to Beach Street, down to, down to uh, Tavern. Tavern. And then just up to Newport Park on Pine, right? No, I would recommend that this starts on Central Street. Okay. But the, the, the area in here is already designated in the body of recommendations as 20 miles an hour. Correct. Um, <laughs> If we drop back to 15 from Tappan up Union to school, um, and maybe do our own safety study, not just uh, just looking at 
accident data and, uh, and other data that might come from that in terms of speed data. Um, would that engineering study comprise more than that? Uh, I believe it does. Uh, Mike, correct on that, Chuck? I'm not sure if they look at the classification of the road and uh, turning radius and <coughs> stuff like that, but um, they would look at the entire thing. So we could have them look at the entire thing. I'm not, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what the scope would be beyond I'm just uh, calculating the 85th percentile speed. Okay. I, I, I'm just considering the possibility of not doing this engineering study at this point, dropping the dropping back to 15, which we already have in that designated area, and um, and adopting the recommendations of the body of the report to 20, and see how that goes for a period of time before we start to drop everything down to 15, because I think we're going to get a pushback for one, and um, it may not be necessary <coughs> based on problems with speed or, or accidents in that area. I know we've had the two pedestrian accidents on the corner um, Union and of beach. Union and, and Beach, um, but that's that's something that's trying to be addressed by mm -hmm. complete streets. So um, that would just be a little bit of feedback about that one engineering study. The other one that was recommended about up by Sweeney Park, um, that's a straight state study, and I really support that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. Did you get, um, did you receive a lot of phone calls from people regarding speed limits or um, <coughs> recently? Uh, as a result of the report? Mm -hmm. or uh, No, I think I had a few emails in regards to the report once I sent it out to the entire group. And uh, pretty much everyone agreed with the recommendations that were on this final draft. Including the 15 including in the, the downtown area. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so again, you were <coughs> recommending just now that we include <coughs> increase the, um, the 15 mile an hour stretch from um, Pine Street down here to all the way down to the downtown area, right? That's correct. Um, so there's not well, one option would be to include that uh, recommendation in this list, mm -hmm. publicize it, and see what um, public comment we gather on. Mm -hmm. We can always modify it before we go to the final decision. I think that makes the most sense. What people, you know, may have. The other thing that Chuck and I had discussed is putting the, our tra passive uh, traffic on in the downtown area just to mm -hmm. get some raw mm -hmm. data before we make the final decision mm -hmm. as well. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> how long a period of time were you going to recommend that we put it out for public comment? Uh, a couple weeks, ten days, month. I mean, it's basically, I think, we want to make sure that we try and reach as many people as we can, so maybe a month. Especially since we're coming up on maybe before Thanksgiving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eli, my understanding is we can't change the, the speed limit at all from Pine Street to Union Street, because that's state highway. Don't believe that's a state highway. The state highway ends at Ashland, Ashland and then picks up at the 1661 cemetery. Fine. Okay. Am I correct? Yep. Yeah. Correct. That's the whole section we can. We have. We, we do have control over. So why did we have to go to the state to get 15 miles an hour? Because it's outside the realm of the um, safety zone, and if we want to drop it lower than 20, then that's when you would need to go to the state. <coughs> so all this would have to go to the state. Some of it. Some of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, all of it has to go to the state for review anyway, but some of it needs actually regulatory approval from the state. It's <coughs> the difference between the safety zone areas being designated and the statutory speed being changed. changed. Yep. <coughs> okay. Um, all right. So, uh, consensus from the board to go ahead and add the uh, recommendation for the additional 15 uh, mile an hour restriction and publicize it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm by every means possible, um, and then come back in a uh, minimum of a month to uh, uh, give us an update on the uh, results. And uh, today is the 21st, so for 18th of November, the meeting after that in December. 
of those two. Um, all right. Um, I have another like four or five minutes allocated to this on this particular um, uh, on the time budget for this. Does anybody from the public got any uh, questions or comments on this? Uh, okay, I'll take you first. Uh, Steve Hamilton, 51 yeah, Forest Street. Microphone over to him. Uh, Steve Hamilton, 51 Forest Street. So I'm just curious, I don't know if this study, it doesn't sound like it uh, looked at Forest Street. I know um, recently there's been some markings and some postings added, which I think has been helpful. But I think one of the issues we have is that now that there's things like Google Maps and Waze, uh, the commuter traffic, even though there's signs posted, you know, is what usually well in excess of the speed limit. So one question I just had is, is there any way early on in Forest Street we could uh, post something to the effect of not uh, no through traffic or anything like that, um, you know, and just keep it to residents? Uh, I suspect the answer to that legally is no. Um, I don't believe so, Chuck and I had discussed this, and I believe you have to submit that request to the state after an engineering study, correct? Yeah, I mean, it usually comes up in terms of truck traffic, uh, which uh, we've resisted on Forest and Mill, especially during the school construction, because it's just not feasible to route all the truck traffic in different directions. Now, the commuter traffic, um, I'm not, I'd have to go back and take a look, uh, but that's the reasoning that we haven't uh, done that. Just along with that, is there any way to block um, ways or those systems other, other than a posting or something? I've, I've seen you can petition actual ways or Google to eliminate it, but it, I've never done it, so I don't know. Now, I know a lot of people are concerned about speed on those uh, roads, uh, both Mill Street and Forest Street. Um, <clears throat> And uh, we did some experiments with speed bumps, and there's plus and minuses to speed bumps um, and speed tables and a number of other options that we could do here. I believe that in part, the lines that have just been put in were designed to, um, well, it's the first, first line of defense on um, slowing traffic down, is to narrow the visual lines of the road, um, and then to uh, enforce uh, uh, limits more. There's a a pretty good argument for, um, I know some people are not going to appreciate this, taking it slow because <coughs> incremental changes like doing lines um, um, can generate some improvement and it, I think it probably would be a good idea to measure that improvement and then see about uh, <coughs> any other changes that we might need to make after that. Some of these changes have a really serious um, Repercussions. Some of them are expenses. Speed bumps can be <coughs> very difficult for people to deal with, especially if there's emergency traffic. Um, uh, speed tables, I know, are an option that we're going to be discussed. That involves uh, uh, a little bit more of an engineering plan. And then <coughs> rerouting traffic through town can have really significant um, um, <coughs> unintended side effects. So. Steps along those lines, uh, I think, are going to be um, uh, things that we want to take very carefully. Uh, no, um, I'll uh, go ahead. And uh, Steve Hall. Yeah, on. You're on. Okay, Steve Hall, uh, Loading Place Road. Uh, going back to the 80s and 90s, we worked on a, a conservation project to save Long Hill. Uh, what was going on at the time was. Um, the development of over 200 uh, house lots in this area. Uh, things that we did at the time were to um, do some traffic studies, and uh, I'm not sure it's been taken into consideration in the last few years, but we also made uh, Mill Street and Forest Street scenic roads. And um, I don't believe anybody has taken that into account. Uh, we're supposed to have public meetings on anything that happens on a, on a on a scenic road, uh, and uh, the objective uh, at the time was to limit the development and the development uses of the road. The net effect of what's happened recently, ever since we started saying take this route around town in Fourth of July to um, 
to the ways in uh, Google Maps, things that we've just heard about, uh, it's encouraged a lot more traffic, and the traffic is coming from East Manchester, from Magnolia and Gloucester. And if you think about, if you, if you look at the traffic studies that were just done, compare them to the ones we did in the 80s, you'll probably see that the loading that's been put on uh, Forest Street and Mill Street uh, far exceeds what we were worried about at the time uh, with uh, the development of Long Hill. Um, now, just to uh, aggravate this issue for us in that neighborhood, when you post 25 miles an hour on um, Forest Street and Mill Street in places where the road is not designed as a scenic road to even handle that much traffic and then traffic at that rate of speed, you are encouraging a speedway around uh, from the sections of other towns that I just mentioned. You're, you're encouraging a speedway uh, around the golf course to get to 128 or the opposite direction, uh, and, it's a, and it's a real threat to the safety of the neighborhood. <coughs> All the, all the efforts and speed bumps and lines and signs and all this are, are admirable in the sense that it appears the town wants to do something about this, but um, as long as the speed limit is higher at all in, in, on any section of Forest Street and Mill Street, all you're doing is encouraging a speedway to, um, to use that instead of um, the designated highway and the major route through town. Okay. Um, so, and, and I just wanted to leave it with, since it's a scenic road and since we're entitled, we should have some public hearings about the impacts of these speed studies downtown on what it's doing to these routes around town. Thank you. All right. Um, so, so I'm going to uh, uh, take one more, I'll take one more comment over here from this. And then I'm going to try and move on to the next agenda item. And I have, a, I have one comment to make about Dan Mill Street. Yep. I'll keep it really short. I'm Jeff Conley. I live on Mill Street as well. Um, I literally have to hold my breath when I leave my driveway every day. Uh, it's terrifying. I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, and we will be hit by a car very soon. If not, uh, um, it's not if, it's when. Um, speed, your issue. Speed, yeah, absolutely. Um, not only that, uh, the corner of Forest and Mill, I believe, is a bus stop. I know multiple families that will not put their kids on that bus uh, because of the danger, and they're requesting a three-way stop sign. Okay. So, can we start with um, um, the lines just went in what last week? Last Tuesday. Last Tuesday. Um, can the police can do a, a passive speed study on that? And well, our plan was to put it out there next week, yes. Okay, great. So let's get the data back from that, and then we can have a, a, another follow-up on this. All right. We are listening to you. We will. Uh, can I comment, please? All right. I'll give I'm you sorry. One I know you pressed for time. I'll, I'll keep it short. I, I'm John Gates. I live on 155 Pine Street, Upper Pine, between Pleasant and, and 128. And speeding is a real issue. I don't know what the report recommended up there, but I'd really like you to keep it at the 25 to uh, keep this short. If I could uh, meet with the police or some other source be before this is all decided, I'd appreciate that. Absolutely. We're going to post this publicly. You can meet with the police anytime, and you can put your comments in writing to us. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for your work. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I look forward to hearing the input in another month. Good. All right, uh, we're going to move on to item two on the agenda, which is a special fall town meeting discussion. Uh, we have a few items that we're potentially going to put on the warrant that we have to discuss. We're not necessarily going to make our final decisions today based on input that we have for FinCon. Um, okay, so why don't we just go through um, these one at a time from uh, Article 1. So this is a discussion about the 12 acre parcel, which is being considered for offered for purchase. Um, 
Uh, map 62 lot 37 that's an eighty thousand dollar price parcel and there are a couple different options for us um, we're doing this one we can do nothing at all uh, two we can purchase from town funds three we can purchase it from cpc funds and place it under conservation restrictions um, and uh, uh, we need to find out where um, members of the board sit on uh, taking care of uh, dealing with this parcel uh, now or dealing with it in the spring or not at all. Mm -hmm. Comments from the board. Oh, oh, so I'll just, what's the downside to waiting until the spring? <coughs> um, don't know exactly what the, uh, the trust, the owner, the current owners will do. Um, they may seek another buyer. Um, so that's, that's the downside. I thought that there was no access to that lot. There's no there is no, there, there is no current frontage, correct. Is there potential for frontage? Um, I mean, do, doesn't it would be, it would be very difficult to get frontage. Because Mac or the town owns the surrounding, is that correct? Yes, or other conservation or entities the, okay. own land. Is there any private property owner abutting that property? That's not tied up in a, in a conservation trust or not owned by the town? Um, there are a few small parcels that do a it. That are not that in a conservation <coughs> we don't know, Right, we don't know the ownership. There's some property, un, property owners unknown in the area. So it's an area that we've been researching for the last couple of years trying to identify. Have there been taxes being paid all along on the properties? That on this particular property? No, yes. on the properties that. Um, there are some properties that we do not collect any property taxes on. And are those the ones that are bought the property? In other words, what I'm, what I'm getting at is are the properties that can potentially provide road access to this lot, are those all paid up on taxes and everything? Do we need to worry about that? Um, so I believe the answer to that is yes. <coughs> um, I mean, access is very problematic all around. There are a couple of options, um, and they all go through private lands or <coughs> or, or lands that are already under conservation restrictions. Well, personally, I'd love to see it go under conservation myself, um, but I just <coughs> the um, budget. Yeah. Well, when in conservation, there would be coming out of CDC funds. Yeah, they already have funds allocated. Yeah, okay. All right. In fact, those funds are actually allocated, right? So we would not have to. Um, You're in place. You're in place, so we would not actually have to have a town meeting to vote the funds. It's just funds. I hope you have to replenish. I hope you have to replenish. I need town meeting to to spend it. I need town meeting to to spend it. So, um, his question was how quickly are these funds are replenished? They've already been transferred. They've already been transferred to the Conservation Commission or the group that's managing that hundred thousand dollar check. For the same, the hundred thousand dollars was appropriated at town meeting, given to the Conservation Commission for the purpose of buying land that may come up for the purpose of putting it into a conservation restriction. Yeah, the replenishment for that. Um, would happen uh, probably at uh, Springtown because we you move funds over. Anytime. Either, 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 either. I'm just trying to trace back because we approve these funds and they're in a fund to be spent, that fund has to be replenished. No. no. <coughs> it doesn't have to be. At some point it is. They may, they may, they may ask, they may come to us with an application for more money to not replenish it. At this time there's, there's no obligation. No obligation or application. Yeah, I'm just challenging the notion that the money is there so, so that we can spend it. It, it, it is there. I'm not challenging that part, but <laughs> it, 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 at some point there's a replenishment from at some point. If they want it. Yeah. Jeff, thoughts? And that would come from CPA funds, not from town budget funds. 
What's the downside of just going forward with this, this concentration? <coughs> Conservation restriction, it's serious restriction. So if the town bought it, the town could then use it for recreation. They could sell it to a developer. They could use it for anything in the future, 50 years, 75, 100 years from now that may come up. That's the, that's the main difference. I understand. Well, it can still be used as an open space under right. conservation restriction, right? right. Yeah. So uh, they can make trails to recreate, yes, yeah. passive recreation. Yeah. But not fuel. <laughs> they may have to get a state legislation to get permission to develop it yeah. once a conservation restriction is gone. You would have the answer to that. What specifically? <laughs> so, uh, if we put the 12 acre parcel under a conservation restriction, um, uh, what abilities do we have to use it for fields? This is thinking fairly long term, of course. I know we know, but Steve, would you just state your name? Yeah, this, I'm Steve Gang on Norwood Avenue um, on behalf you. of the Conservation Commission. I'm not sure, it's a short answer. It, it, if Greg is unsure, we probably would go to town council to find out the limits of use under a conservation restriction. I can tell you, though, that it would be hard to arrange transit in and out of there and parking. Right. Right. Uh, the area is basically mm -hmm. laced with wetland resource, vernal pools, vegetated wetland, uh, in addition to bedrock and ledge. So um, it would be a challenge. Yeah. To, even if you had no restriction on it, to utilize it even for a parking lot and a, a playing field. All right, let's get this uh, uh, going to. I, I defer to Mr. Gang on the conservation process that's required, but I believe uh, if you place it into conservation, it requires both a two-thirds vote of town meeting and a two-thirds vote of the state legislature to transfer mm -hmm. it to another. That purpose. is correct. Right. <coughs> including, <coughs> including field. Okay. Well, let's take it. Um, take this in two steps. Because we can we can delay it a little bit, at least the decision, if we want to, about uh, conservation. Um, do we want to put this purchase on the fall town meeting warrant at all? Um, the way it's worded right now, um, we can decide um, at town meeting floor whether it's going to come out of conservation. Um, as CPC funds, uh, and there's an article separate to declare whether or not it's conservation. So, where does the board stand on putting it on found fall town meeting versus spring town meeting, just in general? Fine. Conservation. I'm fine with leaving it on the fall. How's this? So, it sounds like we want to put it on there, and we'll decide whether or not we want to do conservation. Um, yeah, so there's one other um, caveat in terms of using CP um, community preservation funds, and I believe it has to it has to be purchased at appraised value. And so we have not had a formal appraisal of the property. Um, so that is uh, um, we have it assessed at sixty. Um, so we have it assessed for sixty thousand. Um, but typically, assessments. Are, it says on. Mm -hmm. well, that's a different. That's a different parcel. Oh right, right. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so uh, <coughs> that's just another step that we will need to take before town meeting um, to get that to get the formal appraisal done. Okay. I mean, chances are it'll be okay, but it is mm -hmm. a formal step that we need to check. All right. Um, to go on that one mm -hmm. yes so then there's a second parcel that um, the conservation commission would request and that actually abuts <coughs> this 
this 12 acre parcel, it's a 5.7 acre parcel, it's currently owned by the town, we took it under tax title um, mm -hmm. back in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, it was assessed as part of the Western Woods assessment in terms of attributes, it has a number of um, natural resources on the property and that were identified in that report and the Conservation Commission is requesting that it be transferred um, under general ownership to having a conservation restriction and being under the um, guidance of the, of the Conservation Commission. So this was one of the three remaining parcels out of the original group of five mm -hmm. um, that you had uh, reviewed um, been in the process for the last few years now. Um, and so two of them have been out of the five, two have been approved. This would be a third one potentially. I think Steve is here to also speak to this. Glad to. So we're bringing this parcel to you um, in the hopes that it can be on the town warrant because it is uh, eminently suited for a conservation restriction. Uh, the Western Woods survey that Greg referenced was done by Cape Man Trail stewards. And their assessment was that this parcel in particular has uh, high constraints against development and uh, uh, medium level value for conservation, which puts it in a sort of corner of the, of the possibilities in those two dimensions that says this is a, a highly suitable for conservation in terms of not, <coughs> not precluding some uh, more commercial use, which is highly unlikely on this site. Um, in general, the rule in land conservation, many of you may know, is, is to think big, not to do these little nibbles. But um, I think this is an important piece, and five acres is a reasonable uh, size in addition to the two that the town has already put under CR recently. So we put it forward enthusiastically, unanimously. I think I commented that the vote was more of a shout than a, <laughs> than a simple yay in the con con. Okay, <clears throat> so this particular request, we haven't discussed this before um, at the board this fall, so this is the first time we're discussing it for this meeting. Um, maybe a little bit um, late for us to be talking about this for the fall town. Haven't you seen this as part of a larger offering over several uh, yeah. attempts we've made to get it on the warrant? Yeah, okay. aware of that. Well, this Good. is the first time that I'm aware of hearing it being requested for the fall town. But did Sue um, Brown um, comment on this parcel? Um. I mean, she's been working with Chris on it. I don't know if she's coming in particular on this one. <coughs> but um, as, as with any um, land transaction, you, you would need a report from the planning board, a recommendation from them as well. Yeah. Is there time for that? Um, there is. Yes, it can be made. You know, that recommendation can be made, made on the floor, floor of town meeting. But, um, well. I mean, we can put it on and try to get those recommendations. Um, uh, we can always move to pass over if we've decided we haven't got um, a consensus on the, on it for the fall town meeting. Um, comments from the board? That's a good plan. Yeah, that's a plan. I, I definitely want to hear from the board on this. So. So we'll make the comment that um, one of the two access points to the first parcel goes through this parcel. So if you do put a conservation restriction on, on this 5.7 acre parcel, you may want to carve out that, that the old lighting world as potential access. Mm -hmm. and just have that as part of the um, agreement going forward. And what, where does where does the proposed money to pay for this come from? So no money is needed in this one. No. Yeah. So this is already owned by the town. So you're just okay. you're just transferring its designation. I got it. I'm just looking to assess that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
no loss in tax revenues either, right? Right. Correct. <laughs> All right, um, it's uh, going to be a little bit tight. <coughs> we oh, just keep going. put it on and uh, see what the planning board says and we'll make our final recommendations on town meeting floor. <coughs> <coughs> Article three, uh, two pieces to this. I'm gonna take the Trask House restoration for $3,000 first. Um, uh, so this is our recommendation to spend three thousand dollars out of community preservation or historic preservation funds for some work. This repair work is going to be done in the library. The repair work has to be done regardless. Um, if we fund it now, it's all in the trash house, not the library. I don't know why I said library. I'm sorry, the trash house. Uh, that work's going to be done regardless. It has to be done, uh, if, but we can fund it out of uh, CPC funds. So they want to spend. They want us to commit the funds now so that they can spend it out of uh, that instead of other resources. So that's three thousand dollar item. All right. The other item is the town common re renovation, and that is an allocation of two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars to um, out of the recreation and open space funds for um, the uh, covering the estimates of the um, work on the town common re renovation. Um, <coughs> Finance committee um, felt it was okay to move forward with this. Comments from the board. Specifically, what does the $225,000 cover for this? What aspects? So that would be combined with funds that we have currently. Um, we have about 125,000 available now. I'm assuming you're comfortable with the, um, with the donation gift that could be allocated towards this. Um, so those dollars <coughs> would pay for um, uh, a new design which lays out of walkways with um, pervious pavers, um, new, new grass, uh, new plantings of trees, taking down some of the trees that you've approved being removed and replanting. Um, additional monies would also be um, brought forth to improve um, the ADA ramps that we have, or the one ramp we have on the side. Well, how town. is it that in our last time we talked about this, we were up around $500,000 for that? So 400, a little over 400. And now we're at two, what is, how is that? Change. I know that there's money through CPC that's supposedly going for this. But so there's a, there's a total of $420,000, 20, dollars That's that's a projected total cost. Included in that is about ninety thousand dollars of contingencies for, the, you know, for something to yeah. go awry yeah. and then cost more. Um, <clears throat> it also, as I said, includes the the ADA ramp being redone um, and the new stairs on the sidewalk <coughs> on the side up to the police station. Um, so we will we will know a firm number come when uh, Thursday. We'll have the bids coming back. Um, so that the, when the finance committee last talked about this, they suggested waiting until we get those bids back to see what the real numbers are and to see if that large contingency is. is is necessary or not. Um, there shouldn't be too many surprises in the actual construction. Um, it's not a building project. Um, so I, I would not anticipate a lot of surprises in the field. Um, so once we get a firm number, it should be pretty close to the final number. And when this first was brought um, before town meeting, do you remember how much was estimated that it was, was there an estimate? Right, so the original, original request, um, well, there's a fifteen thousand dollar request for the design, and then a hundred thousand dollar request for the actual renovation work. And the scope of that was envisioned to be much smaller than it is now. Um, that original scope really was um, taking away some asphalt, putting down some grass, and, and, and beefing up the plantings. That was really the original vision. Um, so it has grown from there. It has grown to include the the upgrades to the to the ramps. It's 
Um, the, the impervious pavers was a significant increase in cost that added about $130,000 above and beyond the asphalt. And where did that request come from? That well, request really came from the community preservation. Uh, yeah, community preservation. Community preservation preferred the impervious <coughs> pavers and then Kong Kong required. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. And the change in the lighting came. Historic district. Uh, historic district. It was a huge increase, but it was an additional cost. Meeting. Okay. With upgraded okay. sewer and power too, right? Gas in lines. That project? Yeah, new gas line, right? A new gas line, new water line, I believe. Correct. Nate Grozier, DPW. Uh, we are going to renew the water line uh, and the uh, gas <coughs> line, and we have to relocate the gas for the honor roll project. The water service for Seaside One actually comes off of Church Street, so it goes all the way across Town Common. <laughs> exactly. So if at any point that service breaks, we're digging into a new lead you know, redone town common. So it's one of those things where we're working in the area. It makes sense. It's a smart thing to do to right. to relocate that, and we'll so we'll relocate that off of the new town hall service uh, to greatly reduce the chances of that. And how much does that gas and water work combined? We're giving it a thirty thousand dollar allowance to and that's, relocate all that's the utilities. embedded in this. Yep. Total <coughs> So again, there's various elements that yeah. have been yeah. added, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, forty thousand there, thirty thousand here, and it, it adds up to real money. Speaking about something that's not necessarily real money or big money, um, does this include the repointing repair of the front steps of town hall? It, it does not at this point. We're trying to get some estimates on that. Um, but we don't have a figure yet for that. It's not in this number. Mr. Keogh, you had a question? Mr. Chairman, just a, a point of information. If you could ask the members of the board to please speak into their microphones oh. the present moment. <laughs> we Actually, we can hear you and Greg, but the other four. Um, we, we, this that, is better, I, Mr. That, Mr. That, that, thank you, Mr. Bob yes. Turner. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, at this point, we need to stay on. All right, so we're, uh, FinCon wants to see the numbers on uh, when the bids get open. So we'll leave this on, we'll make a final decision for now. We'll leave this on, and we'll make a final decision on the 28th if we need to. At this point, we're going to need to uh, have a separate meeting to approve the final. Article 4, unless anybody else has anything else they want to say about that right now. I had a question about the 28th as opposed to the 29th. I thought we had talked about doing that for you. 29th? Sorry, my mistake. I, I think I perpetually got mistaken my memo, so. <laughs> I, just, I, I do think that... Um, I, I think we do need to do a post a postmortem on this mm -hmm. because yeah. it, mm -hmm. it just doesn't seem like the way we should be doing things. <laughs> no, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. We've rolled into more and more cost and complexity with a very well intended project, but I don't think this is a shining moment. Well, I think it's hard when projects get tied up into what gets ends up being required. And, and I think that's where some of the costs started to rise. Through the look of some of the other boards that needed to weigh in on Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I, it, I, mean, I think it followed its natural course, yeah. but if you trace back, it started with, I think, an innocuous, well-intended effort mm -hmm. that I think is still completely valid, but moving, moving gas lines, moving water, taking down trees, even if someone had to come down, these are all things that were not, we, we would not have done these things. Uh, we probably would have prioritized other major things in town, but um, it, it just adds up. And I think if you were to walk off the street and look at this, that's a big, that's a big price tag. I agree mm -hmm. with that, and I also, in addition to that though, I understand that there is money in the CPC. 
Um, but I would agree with your statement earlier that just because it's there doesn't mean we have to spend it. Well, I also don't think it's just That's about money. It's about time spent. I mean, yeah. We've got a lot of other things to solve in town. It's not just the money. It's also the amount of energy mm -hmm. that we spend on problem solving. Right. So, I agree with that. The amount of time about the trees alone <laughs> was a lot of meeting time. Mm -hmm. Uh, nope, we're going to move on. <clears throat> All right, Article 4. Uh, actually, we already discussed Article 4, and I don't think we need to go over this again. This is uh, putting $55,000 in for developing, uh, designing, developing bid specifications and securing bids for the placement of water lines in the town water system. And just for anybody who's listening, the point behind this is we've been finding that um, if we go out to contractors, um, currently, the, the way things go with contract is that we go out to them and ask for them uh, for bids on work like this in the spring. Um, they're all booked up, and then the project gets delayed by another year. So where we would actually want to do continue the, the repair work to our infrastructure, we find that we can't do certain projects because contractors are just all booked up. So in order to uh, get ahead of that, we need to allocate more in money to engineering now to, for next year's um, uh, major water line. So that's what this one's about. Um, it's uh, us dealing with the changing realities of the way the contractors um, schedule up their, their time and make it available to us. All right. Um, <clears throat> So I, Articles 5 and 6 are the last ones that we're considering tonight, and these ones uh, uh, come together, actually, essentially, as, uh, as one. They are um, regarding um, entering a lease or a asking the town if they, they will authorize the board of selectmen to enter into a long-term lease for up to 20 years for the development of compost facility at um, what's now the transfer station. Um, moving it from where it is currently on School Street. And this is a redesign that's partially funded by um, a State Regional Compost um, grant in the amount of $400,000. And the additional funding is coming partly from us and partly from um, uh, private funding that uh, uh, Black Earth has established through the state and I think through private um, funding as well. Uh, yeah. Both. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Uh, the numbers that we have seen indicate that uh, doing this will get our money back in a fairly reasonable period of time. Um, FinCon's position in, on it is that they um, are generally in favor of it. However, they want to um, uh, follow up on the actual leasing work to cross the I, uh, T's, dot the I's on the lease to make sure that we are doing uh, the right thing for the town. Um, so, um, uh, board discussion. When is the finance committee going to feel like they're comfortable with the lease? <coughs> that, well, when they're going to feel comfortable with leases, they want to be involved in the negotiation. Oh, um, I see what you're yeah. saying. Okay. So, uh, we don't necessarily need to ultimately say uh, yes to the lease. Um, this is an article authorizing us to um, enter. enter into it. Okay. It isn't, isn't necessarily going to be finalized by okay. the end of town meeting, but it will be. We will should have some sort of draft on it. Okay. Um, and then FinCom would presumably be able to say, at least on town meeting floor, whether or not they uh, feel the, the leasing discussions are going in the right direction. FinCom also, originally I think we had allocated 200000 um, for the town side, and FinCom suggests that we bump it up to 300000 to uh, ensure that we had enough contingency in there to cover um, <coughs> a very conservative um, potential for any uh, adjustments for <coughs> moving around the current uh, facilities at the transfer station, for example. Um, <coughs> I have uh, one question, which is that in some of the documentation from Black Earth, the lease was indicated as a 30-year lease. In this document, it's saying a 20-year lease. Yeah, we can't do 30-year leases. Sure. So it's 20. Just to clarify. I think the numbers all speak um, very strongly in support of doing this. Um, 
and um, the repercussions if we um, don't, not necessarily with Black Earth, but with Black Earth we have a known entity. Yeah, you know, when Black Earth came in and presented to the board and the FinCom, there was strong enough support for it, <coughs> excuse me, then, that it should be on the line. Mm -hmm. I guess I still wonder whether we've looked at our alternatives um, without even waste management, but um, have we exhausted what, what it might be to uh, move stuff out of town to another facility? Greg? I can't say we have exhausted that metal. Um, <coughs> there, there is a new um, digester plant up in, in Haverhill. I don't know the details about that in terms of um, what kind of dollars that would represent. Obviously, there's trucking costs further. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, can, I can certainly get some more information on that. Well, I think it's important to, to know, even just as an exercise, to know what our alternatives are. But it can't be a binary choice between waste management and, and Black Earth. That there's, there are other ways of doing it. And $300,000 is a capital expense. And if we could manage this as an operating cost, and do better than 100,000, then that seems like it would be another option. So I just want to make sure that we've really looked at, as a town, looked at all of our, our options without defaulting to capital expenditure. Greg, didn't you say that it was either Hamilton or Lenham or both that had looked into the digester? Hamilton had tried, so at their old landfill, they, right. they had solicited proposals for, for digesters. They received none, none. so then they, they um, altered course and they put a solar panels on their old landfill. Right. Um, we, unfortunately, we don't have that option at our <coughs> landfill because it's too steep. You'd have to re reconfigure mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that landfill. Um, but in any case, they did pursue that pretty aggressively and, and came up empty handed. Yeah. I just, I, I think that in, in looking at all of these options, you know, shipping or trucking trash out is a pretty costly one for a variety of reasons. Do we know that? In some of the paperwork that I was reading, there were costs that were... Um, I we know that, that's great. I, I, didn't know we knew, was, I didn't know we knew that. But. No, I think we do not know see, definitively. I think, I think, we, don't know or I I think we should know what our options are. And it may be that Black Earth is the best option. <coughs> $300,000 of town capital expense is, is a lot. Yes, it is. So um, I'm going to suggest that we ask the uh, Sustainability Committee to take time between now and town meeting to, to answer that particular question about digesters. Um, I haven't seen any numbers that suggest that uh, transporting, uh, my understanding is transport costs are uh, a significant piece of disposing of this stuff. Um, but uh, we can certainly ask them, and I know that they've been uh, doing a lot of research around it. Right now they recommend um, uh, composting, and they're uh, large ad ad heavy ad advocates of the composting that we have in town. However, they're also uh, um, pretty well versed in this um, field in general, and I'm sure that they'd be willing to take it up. So I'll ask them to um, look into your question about digesters and um, report back to us before our next meeting. Can we also get some ideas on um, trucking costs and not just fuel, et cetera, but I mean the, the overall impact of using a large diesel truck to move <coughs> our garbage? Yeah, yeah obviously, you have know, a very different end product yeah. right. you know, the two processes. Um, so. Right, so we'll, we'll gather some information. So we're going to finalize this on the uh, 29th then. Yes? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Before we move on, can I just get one clarification? Um, in the notes that you gave us, Greg, you said that um, the landfill project 
um, as proposed, would save over doing nothing um, $116,000 a year. Is that correct? Right. So this is a summary of those numbers that are behind you on the screen. Um, obviously, the big assumption there is that we would continue to do a composting program, and instead of um, the current vendor, we would, we have a quote from from our trash hauler to do this to the same thing. So those numbers are built into this analysis. So the trash hauler is going to just pick up the compost as a separate item and take it someplace else. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's scenario A. That's scenario A. Scenario B is what we're currently doing. So we, um, we are, <coughs> between A and B, you have two different costs for the compost collection. Um, and we're getting a discount, you know, in the $30,000, $35,000 range uh, because we've been providing a site for that vendor to, to process the compost. Um, so then in scenario C, it, it, it improves from where we are today <coughs> because then we no longer have the cost of running the transfer station because the vendor would also pick up that operation. So we, we save not only on the compost site operations and, and doing chipping and stuff that we used to pay separately out of, the, out of our own budget. Um, currently that's being taken care of by the vendor. In addition, under scenario C, you have the additional <coughs> savings of, of not having to pay staff to run the transfer station. If, if we have waste management or JAMA or somebody else taking the compost, right. do we still get um, the credits from the DEP? Would we still get that? Because, I mean, it, right now, what we just got in October, $7,800, or we will receive for the 13 points? So it, it, it's, it's a point system, so that it enhances our points. As long as they were composting it, it would enhance our points. So regardless, regardless of who's taking it. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. And is that for both organic compost and non-organic compost? <coughs> yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, but the bottom line here seems to be that we would save, in scenario C, $116,000, which against a capital cost of $300,000 would mean a payback of less than three years. I don't know any other capital project that we could do that would get that kind of a payback. Street lights. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bright idea. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, <coughs> it's pretty good payback. It's a very good payback. And I'm concerned about doing due diligence, but I'm also concerned about beating this thing around for a longer time than we need to. Yeah. All right. So I just need to ask a question about the 29th. So we need to get it to the cricket that day. Oh. So, so it really needs to be the 28th. So either, well, we could beat the 29th in the morning, <laughs> if that's an option. Um, I can do the 28th. I can't do the morning of the 29th. Unless we need it seven or six thirty. What was the reason we moved it from the twentieth? Again, what's that? I can't do the twentieth. Yeah, do the twentieth. We acknowledge you that they made the night of the twentieth. The night, but not the morning of the twentieth. No. All right, so you're out. <laughs> Why work? <laughs> Little thing called work. <laughs> so we could, we could probably still meet. The night of the 29th. Because we've got because a special in with the, uh, well, they can hold the <laughs> publisher here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to say it nicely. Um, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll have everything to right. you. Right. It'll just maybe be a tweak or two. Right. So if you can cope with that, that's. Absolutely. That's, Thank you that's very helpful. much. Right. That's yeah. helpful. Thank you. You're back in. <laughs> it's all about you, Arthur. <laughs> it's not at home. Someone might as well be here. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so we'll be back on the 29th of that. Not too far behind on this. All right. We're going to move on to 
Item three on the agenda, which is a police chief interview with Ms. Virginia. Oh, I'm sorry, Alan, did you have any uh, comments or, or that you needed to make on item two? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> but thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, this agenda item is going to be um, uh, the Board of Selectmen having a public interview with um, Todd Fitzgerald as a candidate for um, the police chief position in town. And, um, uh, pending the uh, results of that uh, interview, the town administrator will come back to us with a recommendation at um, our next meeting um, about uh, contract uh, as appropriate based on feedback that he gathers from board members. So uh, we still have a lot to go on this um, uh, agenda tonight. Um, I know that there are a number of people in the public who um, are here to support Todd, and I appreciate that. We've received a number of letters um, supporting Todd, uh, and I'm going to ask the members of the public um, uh, submit in writing um, letters of support uh, as as they wish for for Todd. Um, Tonight, uh, this is going to be just an interview between the board and Todd. The decision is not going to be made tonight. It's going to be made, um, a recommendation is going to be made by the town administrator, and then that recommendation will be considered and potentially ratified at our next meeting. So, um, with that, uh, Todd, if you would please uh, introduce yourself, make, uh, well, <laughs> that's well, I think everyone like here knows me. Yeah. <laughs> and here we are again two and a half years later. Yeah. Um, but as, you, as everyone knows, I'm Todd Fitzgerald. I grew up here, class of 89, Manchester Senior High School. Um, I'm married to my wife, Ruth. I think she's here in the, in the audience. Um, my son, Jake, who's 25 years old, uh, he, uh, works in Georgetown Police Department, uh, recently married to his wife, uh, Patricia, and my daughter, Laura, who's a, uh, a student at uh, Regis College. Uh, I've been on the police department for 27 years, be 28, uh, come February 1st. <coughs> uh, moved up the ranks quite a bit uh, with a lot of hard work and especially dedication to the town and the uh, police department. Um, and with that said, I hold a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Uh, I've uh, attended FBI uh, leadership courses. Uh, I, hold a, a I, re I received a trilogy award uh, from FBI leader for uh, completing all three phases of that uh, training. And um, yeah. All right. Um, I guess let's just get right into it. Um, uh, Jeff, you're up first. Todd, in some of our uh, previous discussions, you've talked about uh, the importance to you of um, extending and uh, expanding upon the community policing model. Sure. And I would, would like you to uh, please describe um, the uh, accomplishments to date of those efforts and um, also um, your uh, plans going forward, particularly with um, emphasis on specific goals that could be measured as part of the progress? Well, I'll speak to this, the uh, uh, specific goals first. Um, we measure our, our success by four, four pillars, and that's the first one is, is the most important one, and that's uh, basically protecting the public. We recognize the needs of the uh, community, and uh, we achieve, uh, and by that, we achieve the right organizational culture inside and uh, that will show us that we're delivering a uh, uh, sustainable model. To date, I, I think our community policing uh, output, if you want to say, has been uh, uh, extremely uh, successful. We have a, a robust social media. 
Um, we have uh, we've done coffee with a cop. We've done touch a truck. Uh, as a matter of fact, this year's touch a truck, I got a uh, significant uh, feedback from some of the parents that have uh, were were interacting with some of the younger officers. I think that's a huge thing. Um, we've done uh, <coughs> public safety day with with the uh, playground. We're at right and now we're in the uh, middle of a Halloween safety program, a coloring contest uh, that we're going to be uh, using that as a safety thing. And uh, basically, I don't want to be that person that sits behind the desk. I want to be that person that's out in the public. Uh, but to that effect, I have to have the next in command uh, ready to go to do the day-to-day -day operations so I don't have to be handcuffed, be, uh, you know, basically behind the desk. That's a lot to have accomplished, John. Um, I wonder, in addition to having <coughs> a public media presence, um, what other efforts um, you'd be using to manage communications with residents of the town? Face-to-face uh, -face interactions, uh, the, the interactions with the officers on a, on, a, on a daily basis. If the officers see me out there talking with the public, uh, communicating with them, then they're going to be more comfortable in uh, doing that uh, as well. I, I want to lead by example. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, nice to have you here tonight. Yeah, thank you. And your family. Yeah. Um, how would you um, balance um, staffing, equipment, ongoing training, um, given some of the taxpayer concerns of <coughs> costs, um, and with some feeling that the police budget is too high? Well, I think right now we do a lot of uh, our training. Our in annual in-service is, is online, where back <coughs> uh, several years ago we would have to go to training, and those costs would be uh, increased because of uh, backfilling shifts. Um, as, as, as far as you know, our overall operating budget, I feel it's uh, a sustainable model as we sit right now. I don't you know, see any increases moving forward. Uh, However, we do have uh, you know, one staff member out on permanent disability, and I think that uh, needs to be addressed as we move forward. Um, but other than that, I, I think we are in a good place uh, where we are right now, and I don't foresee any significant increases in staffing and in equipment. Um, just making that. Um, thank you. The other question that I had was, um, as a supervisor, um, we know you have had to deal with some serious personnel issues mm -hmm. um, within the department. Would you be able to talk about one of those situations and explain how specifically you handled it? Um, and what was the outcome of that situation? Um, would you, have, and, and given time lapse, would you deal with it any differently at this point? And just no names, please. Yeah, I know. I, well, yeah, keeping with the respect of all the internal affairs investigations that I've been involved with in the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, since Chief Connolly departed, I successfully uh, resolved um, for internal issues. Nothing major, uh, but it's about being fair and transparent and impartial uh, when you make your uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes a long way amongst the ranks of the uh, department, and that goes a, a long way with the public <coughs> uh, as well. Uh, but thankfully, there hasn't been any serious incidents. It's just, you know, training issues or, uh, you know, one unfortunately resulted in a uh, reserve officer resigning. And would you, is there anything you would do differently? It hasn't been a lot of time, but, but retrospectively? Well, basically everything we do now is uh, is on paper, you know, because we're accredited, and I think that's a huge thing for the uh, town and the police department. So uh, 
you know, very simple. Someone needs to follow the policy, follow the rules and regulation, and then if they don't, then they're held accountable. So there's really no decision making. It's just basically what you, you know, follow the policy and then you have it accountable. So if someone from the community felt they needed to reach out to you regarding an issue, um, but wanted to maintain confidentiality, mm -hmm. how would they best go about that? Phone call. Um, I live at 31 Bennett Street, for everyone to know. You can stop by my house. I've already offered that to people. Yeah. Thank you. So, as chief, if you did find yourself in the position of needing to hire mm -hmm. a patrolman, what um, are three maybe of the most important qualities you look for in a candidate to join our force? I think one of them is uh, someone being that's very impartial, uh, college educated. I think that's a huge thing uh, moving forward. I think that's something that I think Greg and I have discussed new candidates will, will have some sort of college degree. And, and I think uh, whether they're full-time academy trained or, or not, we could always send them to the academy. But I think they need to be uh, a well-rounded type of indiv individual that has great uh, communication skills. And um, you've talked a lot about or mentioned um, your the training that you've gone through personally along mm -hmm. the way over the years. What are some of the key insights you gained from all of that training that you would see yourself implementing as chief? Uh, be fair and impartial. That's one of my biggest things. And I think I've shown that over my entire career because of all the public support that I've had. And I really you know, would like to go on record and, and, and thank everybody. But I've always been taught, even when my grandfather was a police officer here, you treat someone the way you want to be treated. And I think that speaks volumes of, of who the officer and the chief that I am. And, and that's certainly something that you would encourage, encourage yeah. your entire department. In, in, in everyone. And, in, in and again, it's, it's leading by example. Um, well, you, you came in here uh, tonight and started talking about speed limits, so I'm, I'm impressed by you being already. <laughs> the bold thing to do. It's a hot topic. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I feel like the, uh, we already talked about costs earlier, and costs aren't a popular thing to talk about sometimes, but they're inevitable, and, and you, you can't free without costs going up in this world. And mm -hmm. over the past three years, the the uh, the annual growth in costs for public safety has been growing at five percent in this town, which is double the rate of Prop Two and a Half. Um, how do you how do you reconcile maintaining all the services that everyone expects, and as a leader, and owning the budget, having to deal and grapple with this, you know, even without you doing anything, costs are going up. How are you going to reconcile? the cost of the town with, with, the, with the demand for the existing levels of, of service and, and success? Well, I think it's about putting round pegs and round holes. You can find the people that are doing the, have the certain skill sets, you, you put them in that position, hopefully not driving costs up. Um, but I think maintaining <coughs> our staffing levels now uh, and uh, the way we operate uh, budgetarily and the way we purchase is uh, a key thing, and, I, and like I said, I don't see, I, I've had a short time here since, since April, I have dove into it uh, a, a little bit, we're actually one or two percent higher uh, spending-wise than we were this year uh, at, uh, as composed to last year, but uh, <coughs> overall operating budget, in my opinion, I don't see that going higher than what the uh, projected rates are of five percent moving forward. What do, what do you think the uh, the department looks like in ten years? Uh, hopefully, we have a new building. <laughs> <laughs> As I wrote in my ten year uh, vision plan, the building is is top top priority. Uh, it's an office of safety thing right now with certain aspects of the uh, things that we do with with booking and, and prisoners and 
things like that. There's, uh, there's also other things we can do with uh, uh, not housing our prisoners and coming up with a, uh, some type of contract or proposal with the Sheriff's Department to house our prisoners there, which would reduce liability huge for us. But building is where we need to be. Yeah. And uh, what what's the what what concerns you most about public safety in Manchester today? Dogs on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Parking dogs on the beach. It seems like, and Greg would, will know that I've spent probably the last four months a good portion of my time resolving dog issues. Um, yeah, I think yeah. that's a huge thing for the town uh, mm -hmm. right now. Wow. In my day to day operation. <laughs> I'll, I'll be in totally honest with you. I guess the last question is what are, you, uh, what are you most proud of? I'm most proud of uh, being who I am and being the type of person that I am. And it's, uh, I'm very humbled by the support that I have from this community. And uh, I can't, it speaks volumes to me. And, it, and uh, I'm glad that I have that support. And it's all about how I've treated people over the last 27 years. Thank you. Okay, so uh, two and a half years ago, I guess it was now, um, we we're in a similar position, slightly different board, somewhat different board, uh, and a uh, different outcome. Uh, uh, we picked somebody else for the job, and, and two years passed under, <coughs> under that chief. And I would like to hear from you um, uh, your thoughts on uh, how that uh, changed the department for good or bad, uh, what, what, uh, how, and how it affected you for good or bad, uh, bluntly and honestly. Yeah, I'll be 100% honest. Um, 2016, to compared to where I am today, I'm a totally different person. Uh, I, looking back on it, was I upset and, and mad? Yeah, I, I, I was. But uh, for the betterment of the police department and the betterment of the town, uh, I chose to work with Chief Conley. Thank God you guys chose Chief Conley. We, if I didn't get it, to the, then the other two candidates, because it would have, I think it would have been more difficult for me because I had a working relationship with him. His knowledge from being in a, in a larger department, his um, ability to come in here and uh, basically um, change the culture, so to speak, is, is huge. And uh, one of the biggest things that he allowed me to do was to, to uh, be accredited. And, uh, and that's what we do every day is on paper. And, and I think um, back then to, to where I am to now, that's a totally different person. And uh, I would hope that you would uh, allow me to assume this role as we move forward. Well, um, your interview this time around is, uh, I do have to say, a considerably different from the last one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from the board right now? No, I, I, the one thing I do want to say, though, I think is um, this happening tonight was important for the board. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And important for you, too, mm -hmm. to be able to stand up in front of lots of supporters mm -hmm. and share publicly <coughs> what some of your successes have been and what some of <coughs> what you've learned in the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And it's quite honestly the reason we asked to do this. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any other reason we asked to do this. I appreciate that. All right, so here's the um, process from this point for uh, on uh, Greg is going to um, absorb this, um, uh, ask questions of the board uh, members individually as needed, and then make a recommendation. I uh, suspect that's going to be on the November 4th uh, meeting. <coughs> push it to the 28th, but I think, I, I think we have plenty to deal with for the uh, town meeting more to get that squashed in between now and the 28th. 29th? Mm -hmm. 29th. Sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so um, that's the plan, and we'll come back now. Thank you for the time this evening. Uh, Thank you.
All right. Oh my God, we actually have to fill in a little bit of time. options uh, tonight. Um, at the last meeting, uh, there was a fair amount of feedback given to uh, us regarding, and in time, uh, uh, weeks previous to last meeting and in the weeks since, um, regarding the um, proposed changes to the sidewalk and B Street. Now, uh, the original project had called for a 10-foot wide project. And it was proposed at the last meeting that that be reduced down to a seven foot wide um, rebuild of the existing um, uh, sidewalk and putting down sharrows in the road. Um, and this uh, seems, seems to um, deal with a fair amount of the criticism from um, people who did not want that additional 10-foot uh, width and who felt that there were issues with um, uh, pedestrians and bicyclists sharing the actual sidewalk, which was one of the concerns of the um, bike peg uh, committee. My understanding is the bike peg community uh, is okay with a 7-foot wide sidewalk with um, a share on the road. So, um, <coughs> Uh, uh, so we have these things to discuss tonight. And what I'm going to suggest is that we briefly get an update regarding the um, Central Street, um, Union, uh, Central Street and Union Street uh, intersection discussions. Uh, uh, Greg, do you want to discuss the meeting that you had with the uh, um, bike pad? Yeah. Sure. Um, unfortunately, it's not coming up on the screen here, which is, was my hope. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not uh, rebooting here. Uh, um, I'll try shutting down and starting over again. Um, but in any case, a, a group of folks did meet um, last week and talked about a modified plan for the, the two intersections that I questioned here, the, the school central union intersection and the beach in Union intersection. Basically out front here um, at school in Union, uh, school Union Central, um, the basic concept is to have one crosswalk at the intersection coming across Central at the intersection itself, moving the crosswalk um, on school forward a bit so that there's better sight line and the stop bar move forward, and then having um, the curbing on um, Union as it approaches School Street to bring that out a bit to force people to make a more um, 90 degree turn rather than cutting the corner as they currently do and clipping, clipping the curbing and getting very close to the building, etc. cetera. Um, so that's the basic configuration at, at the intersection there. And then uh, part of the plan would also um, turn Church Street 
one way the other way, so it'd be inbound, if you will, inbound to the parking lot rather than out, outbound at the library. Um, and have people outbound um, by um, Seaside Walk. Um, so overall, and then also up at the library, the proposal is to um, shift the lanes over a bit um, northward to allow um, a little more space for parking in front of the library. And so there's actually, um, as, as Chris Shea drew it out, a net gain of one parking space overall in, in the area. Um, so uh, this obviously needs to, to be engineered. It hasn't been um, you know, drawn out with, uh, with the engineer's eye and, and details that's, that's needed. Um, but that's something that we can do going forward. So then, uh, so that's, that's that <coughs> intersection. It should come up here momentarily now that I've walked you through it verbally. Uh, and then at the other intersection, <coughs> at Union and Beach, the modified plans keeps the existing crosswalk across Beach in its basic location where it is, except it would be shorter because Union Street would be basically extended out into Beach. Um, so the curb line of Union would stretch further uh, down into Beach, so the people would be stopping further into the intersection. It would shorten that crosswalk uh, going across Beach, and then there'd be a crosswalk at the Union Beach um, uphill intersection. Um, and so that's the, a simplified version at that intersection. Uh, the parking would remain in the intersection. You would actually add a parking space as you extended Union Street out. Um, and again, um, need some engineering work to see how far out you can bring that stop bar on Union because um, other than passenger cars, uh, trucks of any size would have a difficult time making that left-hand turn down Beach. Um, so we need to play with the actual location of where that stop bar would be and how far the curbing would come out. Um, and again, we need the, the engineer's templates to, to review that. Um, so with those two um, redesigns, again, we need to go back to the engineers to, to fine tune it and to make sure it all fits and, and works with turning radii, etc. cetera. Um, but it seems uh, that we are closer than we have been, <laughs> certainly in this whole process of having consensus on, on what the layout should be. Um, both Buck and Ped and, and, and the DIP folks um, were sitting around the table last Wednesday, and, and um, I think we're, we're pretty satisfied with at least the, the concept. See if, assuming that the engineers don't throw a monkey wrench into it, then we should be OK. Um, so next steps would be to um, to have the engineers uh, fine tune it. It shouldn't take a lot of money to do that. Um, they have all the, the survey work and they have all these plans in their CAD system. It should not be that difficult for them. Um, Chuck can speak to that a little bit. Um, but it, it shouldn't, shouldn't be too onerous uh, to get those done. Um, so with the re-engineered or the modified engineered plans in hand, we can go to the state to talk about what they would find acceptable. Um, I'm, I'm a little, I'm skeptical that they'll accept the Union Beach intersection because it, it, uh, it doesn't <coughs> satisfy some of their standards principally. It, it keeps parking within the intersection itself. Mm -hmm. So they, they, will, they will have a hard time signing off on that. Uh, but that's okay. We don't have enough money from them anyways to do all, all four projects, so that's something that we can pay for ourselves. Um, the school and central union intersection, there's a good chance that they would accept that as a, as a design that they would pay for, uh, but we won't know for sure until we ask them. Um, so, really, I think the decisions tonight are uh, I would recommend you, you go forward with allowing the initial <coughs> engineering work on the two intersections to, to make sure that those concept plans do work, in fact, and that we um, get those done and then we go to the state with those revised plans to see what they're willing to participate in. 
um, and at that point need a final decision on whether or not we're going to use state money for the uh, Beach Street sidewalk or focus on the Central School intersection. Um, so timing is a bit challenging um, just because we, we are in a deadline. Um, the contractor um, ideally would get the paving and the Washington C intersection done before snow flies. We were hoping to get the second project done, whether it be Beach Street or one of the intersections. Um, that's going to be really hard to do if you decide to do one of the intersections with the state money instead of the beach. Mm -hmm. um, I think we would have time to do that in the spring. It'll be tight, but I, I think that's still possible. Um, Chuck and Nate might want to chime in on that a little bit more as well. Yeah. Um, I think timing-wise, we will not be able to address the two intersections before winter shutdown. We will be able to address one or both next spring. <coughs> And that would work with obtaining bids and um, uh, within the parameters of the grant. Correct. Assuming the grant is still available for those intersections as modified, uh, we can go forward. Uh, we will be I have very strong likelihood that I will rebid it over the winter. What's that? What's that? I have very strong likelihood that I will rebid it over the winter to get um. to get it built next spring. Greg? I will not be able to use the existing bids. Right. For the um, the property owners, um, the the Morses for Union and the Crosby's at the end of School Street Street, are they happy with this these iterations? Do you know? Oh, yeah, Greg and Garvin, they can speak for themselves. They're here. Uh, I don't speak very well for myself. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I think that assuming the VHB doesn't go overboard with additional bump outs and you know little curlicues and carbuncles and so forth like that, uh, that they would they would go along with the plan which our town administrator actually walked and pointed. This is the way it should be. I, maybe that's <laughs> wrong, but he he, he did do that. It was a very good idea, and we are supportive. So, from our standpoint, the drawing you see, we're we're on board. And you get an extra spot. Indeed. But you don't personally. No, 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 no. Downtown does. <laughs> and as far as I don't know if Linda is here, but from the DPW's perspective, the um, school street changes and the. Um, Catch basin there. Um, is this compatible with the uh, needs of that corner? Yeah, I, I just need to do it first. Yeah. Before before I hire a contractor <coughs> to do curving layouts and uh, whatnot, I will probably either DPW forces or on call contractors that we already have will complete the drainage infrastructure. Improvements. What other timing constraints do you have on that work? that have to be done before the winter? I certainly need to improve the drainage existing one way or another. I don't know if it'll be the final replacement, but it'll be, um, if you've been out there lately, it's only gotten worse because we haven't been able to do anything to it. So uh, it might be a temporary fix for winter and keeping a close eye on it over the winter. Or if I can mobilize the contractors and line everything up in a timely fashion, then yeah. Um, I, assuming that we're going forward with having these concepts reviewed by the engineer, um, I need to take their final recommendations for the intersection, you know, assuming maybe just a very slight tweak to make sure I get the drainage in the right spot. Yep. So that's always been kind of my hang up. All right, so um, another, so let's talk a little bit more about another practical aspect of this, and that is. Um, so the Washington Street's intersection we're going with um, now, that's going to be executed in the fall. Yes. Current plan. That's the plan. Um, uh, if we decided to, to put these two plans, the Union Street and the uh, School Street intersections, into engineering, um, uh, 
then we would be looking probably to take the Beach Street project and push it out until spring. Or um, so, so there's a couple different outcomes, right? The state comes back and says, no, we're not going to let you do that at Union Street. We're not going to let you use grant money on it because it doesn't meet federal requirements. Um, for whatever reason, they might do the same with this one. Or, um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so the question is uh, the timing of the uh, potential Beach Street project in combination with this. And actually, um, what's your estimate of how the, let's, let's assume the Union Street intersection is not going to fly for the sake of conversation, and the Beach Street intersection um, uh, does pass muster with these changes. In yeah, school, street. Hmm? School, street. school Street. School Street. School Street. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, roughly, in terms of the grant, grant money, uh, How's the cost of that work out against the Beach Street payment? Does it need to do a mental math looking at my um, eyelids? Um, it will not cover 100%, uh, theoretically. I'm still looking at the School Street intersection, still requires um, a rebid. Um, based on the current bid pricing, we wouldn't have enough money to. We'd expend all the grant money and then some, assuming the state was okay with it. Assuming um, that we get a slightly discounted version because it's slightly less carbon and extensions and regrading sidewalks, it's closer to being paid for within the grant, but still I'm skeptical that it's going to cover it 100%. So just like with Beach Street now, if we had gone forward with that, we would be putting in town funds. I think the same can be said about doing any of the other intersections in place of the Beach Street sidewalk. I mean, it's all coming down to, there's some amount of town funds that we spent on top of the grant funds, no matter how we cut it up. All right, um, question from the board. I, I have one quick question concerning this proposal, which is, um, are these yellow areas coming up to the crosswalks, is that gonna be an addition of of um, sidewalk, right? That was the that's the concept. Okay. Again, I think, I think is you're that right, in any way, particularly <coughs> coming down School Street and turning right onto Central Street, hamper fire equipment from coming around that corner? Right. So that's 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 the engineering work that we need to do to make sure that those those aren't coming out too far to hamper that. Because it looks very narrow in the building. Right. I, I think you'll you'll find that being scaled back a bit. So saying no bump outs, but those are in fact coming all the way up. Mm -hmm. Right. So that new blue line is curving. Oh, I think that was paint based on the statement that there's no bump outs. So they're, they're extensions of the curving rather than the bump outs. It's not a bump out in the sense that it doesn't go like that. It right. It's just a smooth curve on the road. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Rose by any other name. <laughs> <laughs> and those are three, three new parking spots in front of the library. Yeah. Again, that's the picture and the concepts. I would take a harder look at defining. Are those three counted in the proposed parking? I believe right. so, but Chris. Aren't there aren't there two there right now? I mean, I've seen people. They're, who they're further up. The idea is that the you'll see the curvy line that existing goes very far down towards those two spots, mm -hmm. and we would be relining that curve to hopefully gain three spots. Just to, just to be clear, two spots in front of the library, or spots in front of the bank. <laughs> Not a library. Yeah. Yeah. And counting up all these ones. Including, well, anyway, looks like we have extras. One extra. One extra. Yeah. All right, so. Um, Chris, Chris, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to make a couple of comments, if I could. Um, uh, Chris Shea with the, uh, on 50 Bridge Street with the, um, the, the Downtown Improvement Committee. Um, we've been talking about these intersections for a, for a long time now, as, as you have. 
And uh, this particular one is important uh, in the sense that um, the, bike, bike, the Bike and Pet Committee has deemed the crosswalk in front of 7th Central the most dangerous in town, and then the one at the top of Beach Street as the second most dangerous in town. So this particular um, version uh, modifies the crosswalks and makes them safer. And um, the extension of the curb, these are curb extensions, so the road is actually a little longer, it's not narrower. And the curb on the side of the uh, 7th Central and, and Logan Insurance, uh, the owner of those properties has agreed, at least verbally, to pay for that improvement, to pay for the improvements on that sidewalk. So this, this is an important uh, item in terms of the, uh, the money. The mo I think the most important thing there in terms of safety is that the, you make the intersection a little bit smaller, mm -hmm. slows the traffic down. The stop sign, you're improving visibility greatly. <coughs> Uh, you move the stop sign 20 to 25 feet forward. You put the stop sign right there on the sidewalk, not 50 feet across the street from you, and with a sign, the stop sign on the, on the road that you can't see. So uh, there, if these are curbstone extensions, not bump outs. A bump out would be an extension of the curbstone extension, if you would. So um, the, the downtown improvement committee is, is has been very vocal in terms of um, the work being done in these two intersections, and if that means uh, forestalling the, the sidewalk, because it's it's really not in our purview in terms of the downtown, but we would just as soon kind of put the sidewalk on the back burner and address one or both of these intersections. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question for um, Chief. Do we do you all, in terms of the two intersections um, that we're discussing right now, um, would you agree those are the two worst in town? And do you think that making the smaller sidewalks is something that would make a big difference? I do agree with uh, the, these drawings here, but I think Chuck and I have discussed it probably would need a significant engineering study, I think, rather than those type of drawings. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Chris on the of those two crosswalks, but I would change the uh, role, uh, which one is, would be my top priority would be the one at Beach and Union, yes. since we've actually had a okay. serious pedestrian impact at, at that location. Thank you, that was my question. <coughs> oh. Uh, Al Sattner, Bike and Pedestrian Committee, and also 72 School Street. Uh, we do support these uh, changes, or these concepts, uh, to put it uh, a different way. We, uh, safety being the top priority, these address <coughs> uh, those issues. In the interim, however, because uh, it sounds like it's going to take a while, and we understand that, even though this has been a process that's been ongoing for quite a while, um, in the interim to make those crosswalks, those two dangerous crosswalks, and I kind of agree with Todd, it's a coin flip as to which one is the worst one. On one day it could be the, the Beach Street, on the, on the next day it could be 7 Central. Um, so what we would ask <coughs> as the Bike and Pedestrian Committee, or we would recommend to the board, uh, in the interim, while we're deciding to do these things uh, and do the engineering studies, uh, for these two intersections is to adopt a another slightly controversial um, uh, solution, but that would be to adopt crosswalk setbacks, which according to the engineering Bible, which I Chuck knows it off the top of his head and I apologize for not knowing it, thank you, uh, you should have a, a sight line setback on either side of a crosswalk to give traffic a better view of a pedestrian standing in the crosswalk. Now those recommendations are 20 feet. Um, so we would ask the board to look at that and it's a pretty fairly inexpensive paint on the pavement solution, um, low hanging fruit as we call it, that <coughs> would make those crosswalks not the safest, but they they'd increase the safety factor in those in those crosswalks, specifically the one uh, right here downtown in front of in front of Town Hall and Seven Central. Uh, when you have cars parked right up against the, the crosswalk, uh, 
it's it's people have to be out beyond the car in order to be seen. My neighbor's 11 year old daughter won't cross those crosswalks because she said to her mother, "Mom, I'm afraid. I don't want to cross there." Uh, so that's something we would ask the board to consider as they go through the engineering studies to look at these uh, these two intersections. Thank you. All right, so. Uh, <coughs> Um, Just a quick explanation. What, what's your rationale for reversing the um, traffic on Church, church Street? Oh, um, so it, it just reduces the, the conflicts. So if you have people turning out of Church Street, either left or right, it just adds to the conflicts as people are trying to negotiate the intersection. So it just eliminates that set of conflicts. Okay. Cool. Um, would that contribute to a risk of further backup at an even narrower intersection in front of Old Superclaim? If you have cars turning left on the church? Where's the backup? I'm sorry. If you have a car going west, turning left, blinking left on the church, yes. and you have, in the, in the height of summer, have cars backed up behind it, and they're all now again backing up into that constraint, constraint in front of the superfine. Isn't that creating more congestion? Is, is a left? Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. I don't, I don't know, I'm just saying. I'm not sure if we're backing people up that often to that extent. Um. <coughs> if they're not going to take That's the left there, they're going to just take it another 100 feet down the road. So yeah, but at, least the, at least the traffic is flowing further up. If there's going to be a backup, you're going to be not <coughs> backing up into, into the highest constraint in town. So this is something with the engineering. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll see if we can get some Is the left turn actually significantly better? Question. Right. Um, so I have a um, practical financing question still I'm not really clear on. Um, so, so I'm, I'm gonna, just going to posit again that the Union Street intersection is not going to fly. And we're going to have to. We we, we want to address that one, but we're probably going to have if if we want to keep that parking in there, we're going to have to deal with it with town funds. Probably not complete street funds. That's my um, my personal operating assumption right now. Um, You're talking about Union School. Yeah. Okay. Um, Union Beach. Union Beach. Union Beach. Sorry. Um, because it's got that parking spot at the top, which mm -hmm. is clearly in the new intersection, and it won't meet federal guideline, guidelines with that parking spot state. Um, uh, but overall, uh, so um, I, I, I will get to you, but I'm going to chew through some of these practical aspects. The other people I've been calling on, for the most part, have been um, committee members who've been directly involved with the uh, discussions here. So just be patient. Um, <coughs> So, um, the um, so the, the question that I have is, um, if we got back good engineering numbers or or good engineering results, and um, on the uh, Beach Street uh, on the School Street intersection, um, and we wanted to use Complete Street funds to do that, and we chose that over the um, um, Beach Street um, uh, part, uh, sidewalk. Um, we'd have to expend those funds by um, June? June 30th. June 30th. Um, and we would have to put town money in to cover the rest, if we decided to try and use uh, that for this intersection here, um, where's that money going to come from without a special? We have sidewalk funds that are currently in the town budget that are this year of FY20. And you think they'd be sufficient to cover the <coughs> Yes. Okay. So that gives us options. Um, We're in the same boat for the Beach Street the sidewalk as well. If we decide to go forward with that, we're spending those same funds. All right. 
labeled, I think, as storm drain and sidewalk improvements. It's general. It's not tied to any street or any project. All right. So from a practical standpoint, we can, um, <coughs> it's tight, but we can execute on this um, and potentially uh, change our minds and do this one mm -hmm. and trade it up and stick with the Washington Street intersection this fall. That's an approach that she thinks holds hold the water? Yes. Pending discussions with the state. Pending discussions with the state, yeah. All right. Now, first, I'm going to take uh, Mr. Coyne, uh, and then I'll take you. <laughs> uh, Bob Coyne, 115 Beach Street. <clears throat> this has really uh, been enlightening tonight, and I applaud the board for keeping an open mind. In, uh, in, in following what the experts had prioritized, these two was, was number one and number two for safety and so forth, versus number 16, which is the Beach Street sidewalk. And <clears throat> last meeting, it was quite emphatic from the Bike and Pedestrian Committee, they were against <coughs> bicycles in that sidewalk as well as the, <coughs> the downtown improvement. So I, I want to interrupt you in there. I've said a couple of times that we adjusted the proposal for that project so that the bikes would not be sharing that space. So I don't think that that's a valid point. To well, it is, and, and if I may interject, the recommended width for a bi-directional bike path is 12 feet. Okay. And that project, the uh, the description for that project is it to make it more bikeability to Singing Beach. That's the whole purpose of that sidewalk. So <clears throat> to put a seven foot sidewalk in there, you're, you're jeopardizing, you're not going to get complete street funding because it's not a bikeability uh, sidewalk. I, I don't think that's, I think that's something that we would put back to the state and ask them. So well, you can. I have a con I have had conversations with them, sir. It's uh, on that. <coughs> I can appreciate that, but that's not your job. That's the DPW. Well, it's job. my job Go because I'm on a butter, sir. If if you don't mind, and <coughs> this project we're talking about is a, is a, to me a dangerous consideration because I have a blind driveway coming out as it is. The Singing Beach Club, and he's sorry he can't be here tonight because he has a medical condition. So, Okay, they have a hundred cars. Mr. Cohen, I'm going to ask you to actually to stop now. Um, the, well, if, if, I've been eight months on this. So no, 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 I understand that, but I actually am going to cut you off here. Um, we've heard. Well, I think you're wrong sir, in doing that. Um, I, I, I don't think so. We've had quite a bit of input from you over the past several weeks, and and uh, <clears throat> I, I, I just from a, a very simple standpoint, if we were to go over there and repave that sidewalk as it is right now, which is essential, the current proposal is, there is no way that that could be improving or creating an additional hazard. So I, I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just going to have to s stop the conversation. It is if bikes are on it, and that's what the idea of no, the sidewalk no, is. No, we have said that multiple times over the past couple of weeks. The, the change in the proposal was not to have the bikes on the sidewalk as put shares in the roadway. And whether or not the state supports that yeah. is something that the state can weigh in on. And this is this is what that that updated proposal was. And then I think we're spending way too much on this. The updated proposal was to have a seven foot sidewalk with Shero in the road, bikes are not on the sidewalk, and if the state says no to that, the state says no to that. And I think that's about all I want to have a Can I just ask you one question? Then what is the purpose of widening the sidewalk a foot and a half? Wasting that money that could be applied to the number one and two projects? To improve the sidewalk for pedestrian use. <laughs> well, <clears throat> the sidewalk survey that was done in January listed that stretch of sidewalk is better than Okay. Any one of them, either one of them. You've read my letter. But it's also, I've read your letter, and it's also a sidewalk which is the worst condition of the highest volume sidewalks. That sidewalk takes an enormous amount of traffic. Yeah. Now, I, I, I really don't want to. And there's never been a problem. Okay. So, so as, a, as a um, resident taxpayer in Arbutta, 
Uh, yes, I'm speaking out for myself, and I'm speaking for the Singing Beach Club too. So uh, I just think if your considerations of these two projects that are meaningful, that people have asked for, no one's even asked for this thing, people are against it. So I just think the rationale, besides my self-interest, is a project, well, what is it supposed to be for? So people can walk three abreast for 100 yards? You're up. Well, I, I thank you for your consideration of, of the two, and I just hope that common sense and rationale prevails, and that you look at the Beach Street thing as what the experts say, number 16. You're definitely up now. Thank you. I'm Jody Morse, 11 Jersey Lane. I also want to reiterate what Mr. Coins had just said about thanking you for kind of being patient with these iterations for the two intersections that, that Greg presented. Um, so there are two things I wanted to mention. One is, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, because Chuck told us last week that if we are successful with this grant, we could potentially go back for a second grant. So I know, um, um, Mr. Chairman, you were concerned about funding, which I think as taxpayers we're all concerned as well. So there is a chance that we could get additional funding um, for uh, possibly the Union Beach Street intersection. And I also think based on what the uh, engineers come up with, we could potentially have a parking situation where we do not lose spaces, where we don't um, violate the federal mm -hmm. guidelines such that this could potentially be funded through the through a grant. Right. So those are my two comments. <coughs> Can I piggyback on that? <laughs> uh, actually, um, a little bit. No, 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 no I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. Okay. <laughs> Uh, John, yeah, I don't think you've spoken. Yeah, this yet. is very. Uh, John Carlson, I'm Walker Road. Just a simple question. Based on the design there, the exit on out onto <coughs> Union Street from beside, between Seaside One and the Town Hall, that will stay bi directional? Yeah. Yes, okay. 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 Um, so it's, it sounds like. Uh, the, it sounds like what we really need to do is to go ahead with the engineering on these two uh, intersections. They are relatively high priority for us. Um, and uh, continue with the Washington Street intersection as we said before. Is that where we are right now? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. so what's the timing on the engineering study? So it's it's not so much a study as a uh, uh, design um, yeah. so that we can rebuild it. I'm, I'll talk to, I told the uh, VHB they would be back in touch with them tomorrow. Um, I'm not thinking it's a heavy lift to uh, use the existing survey and just <coughs> rerun their same kind of analysis in terms of site distances and turning radiuses, parking spots, and striping. So um, I'm thinking we would definitely have it by Christmas to get back out on the street to bid. That's roughly six to ten weeks, somewhere in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would anticipate. Um, could be quicker. Uh, just the holidays would probably slow us down a little bit, meaning Thanksgiving. So um, I don't think it would be that hard. Okay, I guess the question is, does the, the delay in having further study done create any further pressure on timing to get anything done, regardless of what project we're talking about? The only consideration mm -hmm. that I would give is that um, no, in terms of what we've bid and what we've awarded, uh, <coughs> is just to do the Washington City Industrial Section. That is going on with no delays on anything. Um, to We have a shot to implement a sidewalk improvement at Beach Street before snow. That would expend the entirety of the grant, so we don't have to worry about that in the spring. We can theoretically go back and say, we've spent our first grant, we'd like consideration for these two projects, meaning the two intersections that we've just redesigned for additional grant funding. They could say, no, they don't meet the criteria. They could say, yes, you guys already spent your first grant, you've shown commitment to the complete streets process, and now you can go forward. I'm just estimating or kind of <coughs> looking into a crystal ball that doesn't I guess exist. the worst case scenario I'm asking about is we, we redesign, we come back after the holidays, we're in January, we decide after deliberation and with the amount of 
thought we all put into things, the deliberations could take a little while. <laughs> Let's say that it's late January, even February, when we arrive at some agreement to move forward. It then has to go out to bid. How, we're looking at a couple, a couple weeks there for a public bid. Yep. So we're into late March. And this is all the assumption that one of these projects actually does get approved because of the federal requirements, ADA, whatnot. Uh, do we run the risk of holding out for the beach and union, uh, the union and school projects and put at risk the available funding for the sidewalk project, whether we like it or not? Is there, is there, 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 is, that there is that chance. Um, we, they will certainly pay for the Washington C Street intersection. So that's not right. Yeah, yeah, I'm excluding the, the new, the next two. Yeah, if, if, we, if we hit several snags all the way, yes. If we, we get too cute, is there a risk of the, none of the three actually happening because we've run in, into a time issue? Uh, yes, in terms of expending the grant money. There is that chance. So it'll just have to be... These two intersections are high priority. Well, I'm not saying they are high priority. To me, it's not a question of priority. The question is a source of funding. I mean, we're going to do the two intersections with or without the state. We have state funding for a project. So are we risking available funds to actually better the town, is my question. Possibly, but it's hard to assess that. Well, it's if possible. we don't use the funds that have been made available to us and we go back and ask for more, do they say, well, you didn't use all the funding we gave you in the first place? I think there's a strong possibility that if we... Right. I think, I think if we were running up against timeline, come next spring, you would try to scramble and, and do the sidewalk at that point. Right. Yeah. I think that's what you do. So if we're accepting that all projects are going to get done no matter what, then it really comes down to an issue of available funding and how you play the funding game. Right. So why would we risk the sidewalk project, which we are apparently going to do anyways, at, at any point, and we're going to do the two intersections at any point, and we may and we accept the fact that we may have to pay for it on our own. Because we would deprioritize the sidewalk if we could do the intersections first. But you're doing that at the risk of potentially <coughs> not getting approval for federal requirements. That's correct. And so you're putting at risk public funding for the sidewalk project, which is a known entity. So we're introducing risk. Not, it's not a funding question. I, I'm not, I don't have the answer. I'm trying to just make sure that we're thinking. No, it's the way you're laying it out, yeah. That's, That's right. right. Yeah, you're, you're correct. That's right. I think you have the, the I think there's time to fall back. Yeah instead of the, the sidewalk project, yep. if things go south in terms of the timing for the intersection. Because you'll know enough, far enough ahead. I just, I just don't, I, contractor. yeah, I just don't think hope's a strategy, so I just don't want to be on the back end of mm -hmm. this risk. Right. The later we go out to bid, and we still have the completion date of June 30th of spending all the money, if you're, the further you're out, the tighter your schedule is, the higher your costs for those intersections are going to be. February, so March is still over. right. That's, so that's so essentially what we ran into last quarter. Right, right, exactly. <coughs> if we bid, if we're not bidding the project until March, yeah. and it has to be completed by the end of June, the costs are going the to costs are gonna go up. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so we don't receive bids at all. Which right, is exactly. Last year. <laughs> so you got to get it done, and you get you have to work your bids out in February at the latest. Exactly. But I think what Greg is saying is also true: is we can fall back if we see this timeline. And the contractor that we have on board today can still do Beach Street in the spring under the same contract. Ah, okay. Okay. The current contractor cannot do the two intersections without doing beach because of uh, procurement laws, state procurement laws, essentially. Ah. Ah, so actually, that really mitigates the risk quite a bit. Yeah. The, the two <coughs> intersections being redesigned requires a new bit. Yeah. But you do have in your pocket, if you will, the beach street sidewalk. Right. Yeah. If you really want to get cute, mm -hmm. April 1st, when we have town meeting, we could get supplemental funding to do all three projects. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> have we um, covered enough of this? I think we have covered enough of this. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, can we move on then? Yeah. Absolutely. <coughs>
God will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for your time and expertise. Uh, we are making progress. <laughs> Number five, I hope this one's going to be quick, but I confess that pedestrian committee wants new language for their official charter. Uh, the request is to expand our scope to include safe route to schools projects. And uh, you also wanted to discuss parking setbacks and crosswalks, but is that something you actually want in your charter? We just, uh, we just did that you did just under the complete that. streets. You, but you didn't ask about any charters. No. So it's not part of the charter. It's really no. just a, a no, case it's actually the, Please excuse the typo. Mm -hmm. Do that quickly. I didn't see it. Well, that should, that should, I think you have copies for anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, Al Sender, uh, Bike and Pedestrian Committee Chairman. Um, the Bike and Ped Committee was formed in 1998. Um, the only history we could find, we, we have no official charge uh, or official charter. Uh, we did the research and what we could find was the 1998 minutes, uh, which are listed at the top, that shows uh, the proposal to form the committee. Uh, our mission statement was written, Terry, a few years ago by one of the committee members. Uh, so we kind of post that on the town website. So what we would ask the board is to give us an official charter, an official charge, which is the last paragraph. Uh, to make bicycling and walking as non-motorized forms of transportation safer and more accessible throughout the town of Manchester by the sea and in italics this is the added uh, language and to work with the Manchester Essex Regional School District to implement and sustain a safe routes to school, school program at all schools in Manchester by the sea it's something we do now uh, and we've been doing for several years uh, now but this just kind of makes it official. Uh, it also allows or will give us the ability to join uh, an organization called the Safe Routes to School Alliance. There's no cost to it. Um, we work closely with them now. Uh, Judith Crocker is the uh, regional um, representative for, for that alliance and we work very closely with her at present but without any official affiliation. This would give us the ability by adding this in our, our charge, it would give us the ability to do that. Uh, for example, she came to the uh, Touch a Truck event, which was held in September uh, out here in the town hall parking lot and helped us with a bike rodeo and bike safety for kids and she brought a bunch of uh, things to hand out to the kids. It was a, it was a great success. Uh, so we would just ask the committee to consider giving us this official charge, uh, make us, um, uh, you know, make it official so we could actually join the Safe Routes to School Alliance, and any questions, uh, <coughs> I can answer them, or if one of you is a board member, members, okay? Questions or comments to the board? Yes. Uh, I do have a question. Certainly. Um, when it says um, to implement and say, sustain a safe route, what what does implementing and <coughs> sustaining? Well, we do a lot of, right now, we're doing some educational things in the school. Uh, in the, Judy did a middle school presentation earlier this fall um, where she talked about bike safety and pedestrian safety. And so it's really educational stuff. Okay. So it's not uh, it's, oversight of no, any there's, physical, okay, school. No, it's really working in conjunction with the middle school and the high school and the uh, elementary school principals or their, you know, their leadership to try to get kids to be aware of the safety of the safe okay. practices walking and biking. Okay. Uh, Thank you. And the safe routes, actually the they did that uh, before my tenure, uh, the new stoplight at the Memorial School, all of the intersection changes at the Summer and Lincoln, the parking lot changes, that was a Safe Routes grant uh, that the state uh, gave the town, so. Thank you. 
Is there a committee that is the equivalent of like a type committee in Manchester, in Essex? I don't believe there is. Uh, there are in, there is in Beverly, uh, there is in Gloucester, but Essex I don't believe has a, uh, a, a, that's why we can find it, even though it's a regional school district, you know, we're responsible yeah. for Manchester by the Sea and uh -huh. that's why that's added in there. We can't influence what happens in Essex. But you are influencing what happens with Essex students who are in Manchester? Through the school committee? Is that what you're talking about? Like they're, they're at the middle school and they're at the high school. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, if they're going to... Is there any any group over in Essex that... Not that we're aware that of. ...that you could coordinate with in terms of safe routes and having parallel programs at the Essex Elementary School? Not, not that I'm aware of. But we'll certainly look into that because that's a great idea if we could coordinate that with... or get them to... We'd have to get some volunteers in Essex that live there to form their own committee, basically, um, which is a good suggestion. Um, anybody have any problems with this chart? I think not. I'm going to make a motion that we uh, support the change to the charter of the um, Bike and Pedestrian Committee as it has been read out in this meeting. Can I get a second? Second. Any discussion? Uh, one question about any costs to doing this. I understand these, uh, the people on the committee are volunteers who um, support the role of the committee, but um, what happens in terms of review of costs? We have, we're all volunteers. There's really no cost to this. There's no cost to joining the Safe Routes Alliance. Uh, there's no dues that we have to pay. Um, we're precluded from raising any money uh, yeah, from our committee, uh, so we are strictly volunteers. Um, hopefully, you know, we're not costing the we cost the town in headaches, probably <laughs> specific, specifically this board at times. But uh, we do apologize for that. <laughs> any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the Thank board. You. Thank you. Consent agenda. It's probably not so much. Uh, board of Selectmen <laughs> consent agenda contains two items, and one is the Board of Selectmen meetings from September 16th and October 2nd, and one is uh, Halloween trick or treating hours. Mr. Keogh, I believe you are here for that. Well, I'll call uh, Dr. Bradley oh, from the Board right. of Health. And Dr. Bradley, yeah. <coughs> um, so I'm just going to, that's the only, does anybody have anything on the minutes? Um, or this stuff here? Gail, did you get my notes? Today? I emailed them about early this morning. I did not receive okay. them early this morning, but I will put them in. I'm over. Were these typos or substantial? Um, most of them are um, sort of typo semantics. But nothing that impacts the. Hmm? So nothing that impacts the meaning. No. All right, fine. Unless you want to I make a distinction of the right pipe bed. Pipe, <laughs> not pipe. So Got um, it. those changes uh, can go in. Um, if you're not affecting the semantics. Um, let's have a discussion uh, about the. Uh, so, what if we were to pull the Halloween trick or treat hours out and vote the minutes now? And then sure, fine, we'll do that. <coughs> Going to Halloween trick or treat hours, I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda without the Halloween trick or treat hours. So moved. Okay, second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, Halloween trick or treat hours. Um, who wants to uh, talk about this? You want to talk about the Board of Health first? Oh, I'm happy to do that. Yep. We go over there. Uh, first thing to notice is it's uh, 17 to nothing Patriots at the end of the first quarter. <laughs> <Okay>. Important information. <laughs> Kept really yes. I really want to know. I do. I do. I have fantasy football, too. <laughs> 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 and I'm leading our group. <laughs> um, Deb Bradley, Board of Health, 51 Forest Street. Um, so the Board of Health had a meeting on the 17th of October um, based on um, the recommendations from the Northeast um, Mosquito Control 
district and the Department of Public Health uh, regarding the ongoing risk of, of uh, mosquito-borne illness. I attended uh, a meeting um, and questioned the DPH uh, representative and the commissioners regarding uh, what their recommendations were. And basically, the bottom line is mosquitoes don't fly below 50 degrees, but above 50 degrees they fly. Um, and they fly from dusk till dawn. The highest activity area is at dusk between sunset and total darkness. Um, we don't have a die-off of mosquitoes until we have a hard frost of two hours, 28 <coughs> degrees Fahrenheit or below for two consecutive days, <coughs> or one day uh, with a four-hour freeze below 28 degrees. Um, the forecast does not bode well for, um, for a freeze before Halloween. Um, and most days are going to be, all the days between now and Halloween are going to be well above 50, um, and nights are going to be well above um, freezing. Um, I went online and tried to find out what other towns are doing because even though I was at a meeting with representatives from 38 towns, all the health agents were there, um, and for those other towns like ours, there were Board of Health members there. Um, no one spoke up. <laughs> um, so I went online and I found that Andover had, um, which was considered high risk, they had some positive mosquitoes. Uh, they uh, have listed trick or treat between 4 and 6 p.m. Methuen, um, they had a positive horse um, and they were considered high risk. Um, they've moved their hours to 4.30 to 6 p.m. And Spencer, and I don't know their history, they've moved their hours from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. That doesn't really make sense to me because sunset on October 31st is 5.38 p.m. here in Manchester. Um, and therefore, you want to cease trick-or-treating um, after that time. So that's why we made the recommendation of 5.30. And I love Halloween. And it's a great family event. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is our recommendation. Um, yes, you can totally cover up with mosquito netting, gloves, then they would be fine to trick or treat or cover themselves with DEET. Um, but to safely um, post trick or treating hours, it really should end at sunset. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be done on Halloween, it could be moved to a Saturday, but I think you know this is a sign of things to come over these next few years. Usually when you have a um, a uh, vector-borne outbreak like this, it, it usually lasts two or three years, according to the DPH people, but they have no way of knowing. So uh, we're still limiting after-school sports right now? Is that accurate? Well, Until they get a recommendation from the Board of Health. Right. And the Board of Health gets phone calls regularly from um, some of the schools in the area or some of the you know, sports people in the area. Um, and until there's a deep freeze, we can't guarantee that. Mm -hmm. It's safe. Will you be making the recommendation to then, once we hit the 31st, thereafter move that curfew to 530? Is that? I think we should. I really think we do? should. Yeah. Actually, after the November 3rd, when daylight savings time mm -hmm. ends, the whole thing will oh, that's move, true. move yeah. another yeah. hour forward. Yeah. We need a frost by then. Don't we, Miss Driscoll? Whoever thought we'd be <laughs> wishing for cold weather after this beautiful fall. All right, so. So what um, the people involved with the Halloween party have done is move the, um, move the party from back so it starts at 4.30 and ends at 6. So be, that can happen because it's an indoor activity. Um, and I gave, put in... Uh, uh, copy of the article that's going in the cricket and also going to be released out by um, the constant contact and the park and rec um, sites uh, tomorrow um, talking about trick-or-treating and talking about the hard frost um, it, it needs to end at 5.30 now I think we all know that there's not going to be any trick-or-treat police out there and some people will just say Hey, I trick or treated for many, many years. It never hurt me. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, I'm going to take my kids. I'm going to bundle them all up and cover them all up and and go trick or treating. 
you can't stop them from doing that. I think the article just talks about um, trying to be safe for everybody, the kids and the adults. It is a change, but it's just something that we're going to have to work with. If it looks like this is going to be something that continues, as uh, Deb has talked about, um, then it might become something that we wind up thinking about having trick-or-treating from 2 to 4 in the afternoon on a Saturday. So that's, that's what I have. There are many towns in the state that have not had a positive case with animals or humans, haven't had any, um, any positive mosquitoes, or they don't test at all, and they're just letting it go. The state's yeah. going to be all over the place in how they handle this. Yeah, so we don't have the towns of Essex, Rockport, and the city of Gloucester do not have any testing done by the Northeast Mosquito Control District because they're not members, correct? That's correct. Um, yeah, and, and a lot of towns don't stipulate Halloween hours. Yeah. I mean, we never have until yeah. this. Well, and this is just a recommendation. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. I think, so to that point, I think it's very important if information is going to start getting sent out, that it be worded appropriately enough with the word recommendation or I just, there's, mm -hmm. there's going to be lots yeah. of questions once this hits the streets. That is to, this is a recommendation only based on, you know, prudence. And Department of uh, and Board of Health right. recommendation right. based on all of the research and discussions that the Board of Health has had. I, I, I just think it needs to be framed mm -hmm. properly to minimize the, the the distraught of the information. I don't. We don't want to send a mixed message to emphasize it's a recommendation only. <laughs> I mean, I think in terms of what the police do for for blocking roads, I think they should end at the same time that the well, parties are. And, and that's what I'm saying. I just, I, I, just, I agree, yeah. but I'm saying the information that goes out needs to be all encompassing. If that's, if the town Halloween party, which is made up of a but you know, generous volunteers are going to have it you know, these hours, then the town, then the police should be following up with their information that that's, those are the hours that they're going to do what they do. Right. So, I, I just think that more concise information that gets out the first time, the better. Mm -hmm. So the, the um, information on trick-or-treating says trick-or-treating in Manchester has always been fun for the children. This year, due to mosquito-borne illnesses, Triple E and West Nile virus, and the lack of a hard frost, 28 degrees or less for four hours, the Board of Health recently voted, quote, outdoor trick-or-treating in Manchester should be completed by 5.30 p.m. to reduce the risk of mosquito exposure, right. end quote. So, and, and we all understand that. The should be is mm -hmm. what is going to create all the questions. That, that's all I'm saying is we all know it should be those hours. So the, uh, is the, so does the official party line become the trick-or-treating hours are 4 to 5.30? Okay, that, that's what I was trying to get down to. But do the, do the police, what do they, do they block off uh, Pleasant Street? No, they block off Brook Street, Norwood yeah, Avenue. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Um, in right. Yeah, the I'm, a, of I'm the a little village. out of date with that, but yeah. um, <laughs> do they really have to? Do the police have to adhere to those hours? Because it is it is a safety issue. If people and kids are still out there, it's dark. Well, that's what I. We I can. Know. We we, I mean, we, we have to educate one. the public. It's not a police state. We have to educate well, the that's public. Not what I meant. <laughs> and and but we also have to protect kids. And and there are always people who don't follow recommendations. Um, and I'm not advocating that, but I'm, I'm just saying that if there are a lot of kids out there, I think the police should... The streets will be blocked. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not saying it's a police state. <laughs> no, I, I know you didn't. No, no I'm, not, I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth. I, I, I can see the confusion 
that this information is going to create for people. And because it's angst, a change. Because it's a change. Yeah. And the angst and the frustration. So my only point is, whatever the information is, it's, it needs to be communicated the same way with the same information by each group that needs to communicate it. That's my so, point. So what if the information that went out to townspeople who may be, for better or worse, passing out um, non-Board of Health approved treats. <laughs> um, what, what, if, what if the information that went out to them was, be aware, you may see trick-or-treaters starting at 4 o'clock because the Board of Health is recommending that all trick-or-treating be done between 4 and 5.30. I, I think, I think that the, the, the real frustrating thing that may extend trick-or-treaters hours um, over any fear of being um, subject to these mosquitoes is um, that they wouldn't get candy and that they would stay out, they would go up to a door and no one's there to pass anything out to them and then they would stay out longer trying to get the heaviest bag that they could <laughs> before they retired for the night. The other thing uh, Jeff, that I've done in the article is it mentions that any people that have trick-or-treat candy that they would like to come and pass out at the Memorial School may do that at the entrance to the Memorial School. Containing no nuts. Contain, it does say no peanuts or peanut butter. Or no nuts at all. Well, I'm there. <laughs> Tree nuts. Tree nuts, thank you. <laughs> this is going to be a real problem to work with families, too. Yeah. No answers yeah. at some of the doors. Yep. Yeah. 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 Parents yeah. come yeah. Yeah. home until 5 15. And treating will be yeah. home at 4 in the afternoon. Okay. So uh, we've got a couple different uh, rounds of this, and we're talking about the wording of this. Also, uh, I was I thought I was clear on what the position was going to be for the police department with respect to traffic, and then I became unclear on that. So, um, uh, what was the thinking about the road closure times? I think maybe Todd can. I think that uh, think about it. it's just a simple stroke of a key. We could change and adjust fire, you know, as as needed. If we need to extend it, we can extend it. So you just tell me what the official trick or treat hours would be, and that's basically what it would be. By so recommendation of the board of health. Yeah. <coughs> What's that? Right. I think I think the police need to end blocking streets. By six at the latest, or six fifteen, get the kids home from. The I park. agree, but if it's a, if there's, you know, I don't know if you've seen Norwood Ave and mm -hmm. Brook Street. There's hundreds and hundreds of people walking around. So if we need to extend it, then we're, we're mm -hmm. just going to have to extend it. I, I mean, I agree, and I think that that saying these are the official hours, mm -hmm. or what the official recommended hours, but. If you're out there, and as you say, there's still a lot of people out, you, can, you, you can't you just, just open the go home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I sincerely believe there. that people will extend it. You know, we make our recommendations, yeah. but people will extend it. And they will. And we have to be prepared for that as a town. Agreed. Right. And I, I mean, you know, the best we want to protect everybody, yeah. and, you know, the best we can do is make recommendations. Educate the public and then they'll do what they're going to do. Exactly. And I, but I still think to what Todd's saying is if there are lots of people out, you don't just roll away the, the police. No. But I also think the message has to be clear from everybody that's going to be the same message coming out. So. Mm -hmm. What we put out on social media and so what the Board of Health puts out, but Parks and Rec all has to be the same thing. Agreed. Yep. Yep. Alright, so... Four to five, four to... Is that constant contact all set up and ready to go tomorrow? Nope. Or no, not yet. Okay. I have to right. do it tomorrow morning. Okay. I just think it needs to be that same message, whatever the message is. Recommended hours. So what are they so we all know? 4.30 to 6. 
Hmm? Four thirty. Oh, sorry. Four to five thirty. Four to five thirty. Because the sun set at five five thirty eight. Right there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Four to five thirty. And the roads are going to be same hours. That's same. what's going to be four to five thirty. So. And if we need to extend, we'll extend. And the police yeah. will adjust as necessary. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't have to print that. that part. No. No. That's a given. No. At tight's discretion. If his bag's not full. <laughs> if his bag's not full. Do people bring you candy when you all are sitting out there? I sure do. I should. I believe that people are shocked. Yeah. No. So there is still some concerning concern about the wording of this. Uh, I think we can leave that up to the chief. Thing. Tom. Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Tom did a good job. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Work with Todd in the morning with the message. Yep. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll meet in the office. I'll go from the board, does it? He's saying, don't give up, don't give up. Uh, <laughs> Except we're going to say something, Tom. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, take a motion to accept the recommendation of the board of health on uh, Halloween trick or treating hours. So moved. So, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Correspondence. I'm not going to read through this. It's after say how wonderful this is. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, you and the court yes. for all the work and the research you've done on, yeah, on this whole, not just Halloween, on the last couple months. And I know more about mosquitoes than you ever thought you know. <laughs> That's true about septic systems. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew there were so many different kinds of mosquitoes yeah. all in one area. But yeah. when we tested positive, um, they, in that trap, they picked up 167 mosquitoes and 117 right. of them were the ones that bite humans. And it was so good that we sprayed that night because it prevents them yes. from laying larvae that will hatch next year. Right. Our count went from 167 in that trap to 17 the next week. Wow. So that was huge. Yeah, I mean, it sounds strange, but it almost it makes sense that we were lucky that we trapped an infected mm -hmm. mosquito when we did. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to make Ted very happy. Thank you. Thank you. It's 24 to nothing now. What's the chance? Go fast. All right. Town administrators and boys. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. I've got a couple more to add. Uh, construction update for your uh, doing paving work on Oxford Heights. Uh, a snag last week. And service lines that, that was corrected. Um, they'll proceed uh, out of full depth reconstruction, but it will still um, produce a pretty good product. Um, the eastern the pipe work in the eastern part of the town uh, been delayed a little bit. We're still hoping that they're mobilizing in the next week or two, and we'll get. Um, word out as soon as that gets firmed up. Uh, the group organizing on Cape Ann, uh, looking at some climate action responses on a, on a regional basis. Um, there's another meeting this coming Wednesday, if interested at the Unitarian Church at 7, mm -hmm. so feel, feel free to come. Uh, so I think that'll, that'll grow in effort, I believe. It's a, lot of, a lot of interest seems to be there in that. Um, Hiring a communication specialist, uh, two strong candidates. Um, we'll be vetting them the rest of this week and should have someone on board by the 1st of November at the, at the latest. Okay. So that's progressing. Um, similarly, uh, moving forward with uh, schools hiring an SRO officer, a school resource officer, um, again aiming for the first of the month for that to be in place and, and operational. Um, if assuming it's one of our officers, then we'll be doing some modifying of our um, in-house hours to cover um, in-house. We, we won't. Um, we'll basically take some of our detective hours and put it into patrol, so that we don't have to um, incur more overtime or anything for that. Greg, are you aware of whether Essex had a candidate come forward? I'm not aware that they have. I don't believe they have. A um, couple of other things. Uh, we did have um, almost uh, two dozen boats get pretty seriously damaged uh, with this storm. 
Um, it, it came from about the worst direction in terms of our harbor. Our harbor is very good, um, but it is it does have one exposure, and that's where the storm came from. That's sort of that uh, um, southerly winds coming straight up um, and into the harbor. Um, so uh, it does raise the question of, of making sure that we impose minimum standards for the tackle. We don't have that in place right now. Um, so it is something that the Harbor Advisory Committee will be reviewing. Um, because some of the problem is your boat may be fine and your tackle may be fine, but you get hit by another boat that broke loose. Um, so that, that does cause a problem. Um, so you may be hearing more about that. Those are all um, owned and maintained by the boat. Correct. Owners, right? yeah. yeah, correct. Okay. But what we're possibly, but what many communities do is they um, insist on a minimum standard. Um, mm -hmm. based on size and weight of boat. Uh, so as, as, as Brian has investigated what failed, yeah. you know, some, of, some of the boats just had way undersized uh, anchors. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a number of them just, just sort of rough up and down, just basically sold through the, the lines, mm -hmm. which, which is hard to prevent. Um, but anyway. Yes something that you may hear more about. Uh, um, this, again, for your calendars, uh, this Friday, um, the Chamber is hosting an education, their annual education caucus at, at Gorton's. Um, that starts at 7.30, and the legislative delegation will be there. Um, there is a, a bill that the uh, Senate has approved to um, re basically put in a <coughs> five billion more the B into education funding um, over a seven year period. Um, it'll go on to the House. Um, I'm sure that'll be sort of front and center the discussion on Friday. Um, so again, you're welcome to attend. Um, just if you want to let Sonia know or me know, we'll, we can RSVP for you to the chamber. Um, 7.30 p.m. 7.30 a.m. A.m. Until? Uh, 9.30. Basically, 7.30 to 8 is sort of refreshments and mingle, and then 8 to 9.30 is the, the real meeting. Did and you say 5 billion? No. Did you say 1 billion, 5 billion? 1.5. One oh, thank you. And where is that meeting located? Okay. Oh, that's at Wharton's um, in Gloucester. It's in their boardroom. Okay. 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 All right, any other items uh, for open session? All right, can we get a motion to go into executive session per Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Sub 2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non union, union personnel and union contracts, not to return to open session, and the chair so declares. So moved. Got a second? Second. All in favor, Mr. Snyder. Aye. Aye. Mr. Bowen, aye. Mr. Snyder, yes. aye. Yes, Mr. Johnson. Yes. yes. Rodmerton, sorry. All right. We're done for the night. Thank you. Bye.